Good evening, everybody. Welcome to The Dentist Show. I hope everybody is well this evening. Um, make sure that if you are watching, you click that share button. It's really, really important that you click that share but uh, button. Um, I'm going to be coming on the screen very, very shortly, but I just want you guys to all tune in, get in. Um, if you're watching on YouTube, make sure you like and subscribe to the YouTube channel. If you are watching on Facebook, make sure you do a watch party with your friends and family. Tonight is all about fibroids, the untold stories of women, symptoms, the effects, treatments, and our lifestyle. How is it affecting our black women? And why is it affecting a lot of black women in general? These are the conversations that we are going to be having um, today. We've got doctors on, we've got you know, young people um, that have experienced fibroids, have had surgeries, and you know they're going to be sharing their stories with you. Um, so it's going to be a really packed, insightful, inspiring conversation that we're going to be having today. Um, so let me see if everybody is ready for me. Okay, I can see Khadija is on. Winnie is on. Winnie, how are you? Hope you're well. Um, okay, let's see. Let's keep sharing our pages, guys. Let's keep sharing our pages. Okay, good evening. Today is Sunday and it's Social Sundays um, on The Denta Show. You know, Sundays is where we talk about social issues that affect in our community. Um, and I think it's really important that each and every time we talk about issues that, you know, sometimes we are afraid to talk about. Um, and I've got really amazing guests um, on today. And for me, how I found some of them were actually online. I hashtag fibroids. And then I saw them um, on, on Instagram, read about what they were doing. Um, you know, someone like Tamika, she's got this organization that has, you know, we can, you can wear white too. I mean, that's so significant. Why is it that she's named it white? Um, and um, I'm going to be talking to her shortly. Um, I've got Dr. Dan Salt. I've got Akia. I've got Womb Babe, Latoya. Um, so many inspiring young ladies that are going to be sharing um, their stories today. Um, but before I bring them on the screen, as you know, I need to thank um, my sponsors, um, World Remit. Um, thank you so much for sponsoring The Dentist Show. Um, I can't thank you enough. There's like 5.7 million people. You can 5.7 5 5 million people that are sending money to Ghana um, by subscribing to um, World Remit. You can download their app. You can send the money via um, your laptop in seconds. They'll get the money. And also, I must say a big thank you um, to this amazing product. Now, look at this product, guys. Um, it's Glow Village. Okay, Glow Village is by Mami. She's based in the US. She's come out with this amazing shea butter product line. Um, I urge you all um, to go online. I'm just going to put her details in here. Go online and you know subscribe and buy some of her products. It's amazing. It's you can you can follow her on Instagram. It's Glow Village um, or on her website. It's www.glowvillage.com. Go and buy one of the products. Let's support our own. She's got these balloons. Um, can you see how lovely it is? Whatever, whether you're celebrating a christening, a birthday party, you know, she will be able to get you nice balloons for a gift, for family, friends, whatever. Um, those are her details down, um, down below as well. Um, make sure that you go and, you know, buy um, and support black owned businesses. This is what it's about. We need to be supporting our own. So make sure that you go out there and purchase that. And then I've got Seek VR. So these amazing headphones, again, made by a Ghanaian um, entrepreneur by the name of Mary Spio. Um, you can get one of these headphones. It is amazing. I've got one of my own. If you go online and type in www.seekvr.com and add Denta VIP, you will get 10% off 
yes, you get 10% off. So make sure that you go online and order one of these products. Absolutely amazing. Um, and if you're somebody that really um, wants to invest in Ghana, want to know more about you know partnerships, investing in agriculture, real estate, um, subscribe to Odana Connect. Um, they will be able to signpost you to um, job opportunities in Africa, investment opportunities, go online to Odana Connect and they will be able to assist you. And then I've got my amazing um, seasoning, my jollof seasoning and my all-purpose seasoning and my shito by prodigyfoodsco.com. Make sure, again, you go online and buy one of these products. Her shito is amazing. You will thank me later. I know you will thank me later. So go online and make sure that you purchase these amazing products by young entrepreneurs that are doing amazing things. Okay, I know that you guys are eagerly waiting for this conversation, but I wanna head over to you guys and see what you're saying to me um, online. So I've got Stephanie, I've got Mercy, I've got Akia. Um, guys, Mercy, please share your page. I'm going to be checking that everybody's sharing their pages. And also to my speakers, I know you can hear me. Please share your pages on Facebook and on YouTube to your friends and family. Um, all you have to do is look for Dentist Show or you go to Odana Network on YouTube and just share your page, especially with like YouTube. You can share it on um, Facebook, on uh, Twitter on LinkedIn, just share your pages so we can get um, a lot of people watching today. Um, it's really important that we, whilst we are sending out the message, we get a whole load of people that are being inspired and impacted by the conversation. Hey, Akia. Okay, so I think I'm gonna start, you know, introducing my guest on. I know that you guys are eagerly waiting for everybody. And I'm thinking, who do I even start with? Because they're all so amazing. And I know that some everyone's always like, hmm, who wants to go first? Who wants to go? I think I'm going to go with Latoya. Okay, let me bring Latoya on. Hi, Latoya. Hi. Hi, everyone. I knew you were going to choose me first. I knew you were going to choose me first. You know? I was like, she's going to choose me. <laughs> Sis, um, thank you so much for joining me on the show tonight. I really appreciate um all of you for, you know, um, at such short notice, um, confirming and being on today's topic. Um, I know it's something that's very um, passionate um, for you, um, somebody that, you know, I think it happened to you in 2015? Yeah, when I first got diagnosed, yeah. The when first you got time. diagnosed um, mm -hmm. with virus. So tell me a little bit about yourself, what you do. Tell me about your page, the womb babe, why you decided to call it that. Um, and... Um, what happened with your journey? So, my name is Latoya Pasimbra, everyone. I'm a HR administrator. Um, I decided to launch my platform, Wimbay. Um, the reason why I called it Wimbay, number one, is everything related to the room. And because that Bay word has been used all of last year and this year, so I decided to just add the bay to the room and just make just call it room bay because obviously it's my bay it's my baby I want to protect it I want to take care of it so that was my reason behind that name um yes I was diagnosed with fibroids in 2015 had an operation um to take them out but then they grew back again in the space of four years so I had another operation in 2019 so the one in 2015 was in my pregnancy sac, so I had to remove that immediately. And then the one in 2019 was causing really bad pains and it was inside my uterus. So they had to take those two large ones out. So now I'm fibroid free, but I have to be careful because as the gynecologist just said, they can grow back rapidly. They just don't know how it, how it comes. So that's something that I'm still educating myself and finding what causes them to grow. Okay. And, you know, when you started your, your the womb, babe, how has the response been to women subscribing to what you're doing? Um, to be honest, the whole point of womb, babe, I just wanted to touch at least one person or even three people, but it was, the response was so overwhelming. Um, 
a lot of women were just messaging me saying thank you for doing this because it's such a taboo no one talks about it and thank you for sharing your story because I did tell them my story and my journey up until now so I did get a lot of direct messages emails and it was just overwhelming and it was I didn't expect all the love and support so I'm very appreciative of that and I'm just going to still continue because it's not just about fibroids I talk about on Wimbe it's other underlying issues of the room so it's endometriosis PMDD mm. PCOS mm. pelvic infection so I'm if I just I want to reach out to everyone that's going through something within the room yeah that's why I can use Fantastic. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. I'm going to bring you back on, but I want to introduce everybody one by one and I'll okay. bring you back. On, yeah. Thank yeah. you so much, Latoya. Okay. So I think I'm going to go over to Dr. Hawkins. Hi, Dr. Hawkins. Hello. Hello. Hi. Thank you for having me. Um, thank you so much. All the way from Jamaica. <laughs> I'm going to Jamaica tonight. I'm actually in Atlanta right now, but I'm going Atlanta. to Jamaica. Tonight. <laughs> oh wow oh thank you so much doc um i really appreciate your time and just for me to even just you know dm you and you were just like yes let's do this and i know that you're very passionate about it you're a gynecologist yes. um but doc tell us what is fi fibroid when people say what is fibroid Yes, so fibroids are actually the most common benign tumor in women. It is a tumor that grows right from the uterus. So the cells of the uterus harbor the cells that are able to make these tumors. Over 70% of Caucasian women and 80% of African-American women will have fibroids at some point during their reproductive years. These tumors can grow in size and become symptomatic, cause heavy bleeding, pain, discomforts, bloating, make your abdomen look large. But many, many women are affected by these benign tumors. But Doc, I mean, how did they develop in a woman? Like what, is it something that we're, is it our lifestyle? Like how does it develop? Not necessarily. It's multifactorial. There is um, a genetic component to it. A lot of people think that it's hereditary, but we have some people that have it. I had it and no one else in my family does. It's influenced by the things that we eat, some of the hormones that they put inside of our foods. There's research that shows it may be influenced by our cosmetic products or the products that we put in our hair our vitamin D oh, deficiency. Wow. There's a lot of different connections, but it's not just one thing for each person. And any woman, as long as you have a uterus and you have ovaries that make hormones because the fibroids grow from the hormones that we naturally as women make can have fibroids. So any of us can have it. Many women have it and don't even realize it. They're asymptomatic and they'll never know, maybe until they get pregnant and they see it on a pregnancy ultrasound. It is why is fibroids exclusive to just women? Is it because of our hormones? Correct, correct. You have to have the myometrium, which is the muscle of the uterus that is influenced by our estrogen and progesterone, which is the hormones that our ovaries make and that is unique to women. So the hormones that are our female sex hormones is what causes and influences fibroids. Okay, but do you find that it's more genetic are like some of the research showing, I mean, what is the stats in terms of more genetic or more diet or more food? What what is what is what is the I wish we knew. Saying? Yeah, I wish we knew. I wish we knew what that recipe was for each individual. I wish we could even predict to say what is your risk factor, with the exception of just knowing that certain um ethnicities, African-American women, Hispanic women are more prone to fibroids. Other than knowing that, we actually don't know if your mother and your grandmother and your aunt and cousin had it, what does that mean for you? Does that mean that you're 100% going to have fibroids? Not necessarily so. I have many patients who say my mother had fibroids, but I've never been diagnosed and I have completely normal cycles. There's no reason for anybody to even suspect it. So we don't know. Isn't that sad? It's the truth though. <laughs> Oh my God, no. And, and you know, because I, I, one of my friends had, uh, well, actually, my cousin, my friend, a few of them have had fibroids, and some of them have had the surgeries and have taken it out. And some of them look like a baby, like it's so yeah. big. Yes, yes. What? How does it grow so big? Yeah. And the scary part is that it can grow big and you don't even know it. My fibre, my uterus was about 18 centimeters which is almost a five month pregnancy before I was diagnosed. And I had absolutely no 
flu, none at all. I've had women that have had 20 centimeter fibroids. A baby's head is about 10 centimeters. Can you imagine 20 centimeters living in their abdomen and they had no clue that it was there? So yeah, it can sneak up on you. And the symptoms of fibroids, a lot of times people think it's the size that matters. It actually is more important where the location is. The location tells a story. I can almost tell patients where their fibroids are when they just share their story of the symptoms that they're having. So it's amazing how much they can grow. And that's why having these type of discussions is so important to educate women that you may be having this symptom and not even know that it could be a fiber that's growing and causing them for you. Mm. And is it always that you have, um, I know one of my friends was saying that they got a lot of clots. They were mm -hmm. getting a lot of clots in, during periods. Yeah. Is mm -hmm. that always the symptoms? It's not always the case, but it's one of the common symptoms because with fibroids, you bleed heavier during your menstrual cycle. A normal menstrual flow, someone might change their menstrual pad or tampon maybe four times a day and not wake up in the middle of the night to change it. But when you have an excess of that due to fibroids, because the fibroids are growing close to the cavity, a lot of times what you'll see is that the fibroids will bring their own blood, they sequester their own blood, and then they're disrupting the menstrual lining, which also is adding to the heaviness of the bleeding. And then the blood flow is so heavy and accumulates so quickly that they form these clots. It's almost like they're building up more blood than their body can actually push out. And that's how wow. clots form in the cavity. So clots are very common. And then pain. So a lot of people think that fibroids are associated with pains, but not usually. Fibroids themselves don't cause pain. However, the clots that are pushing against the cavity to try to push themselves out are, is what causes pain. The uterus is a muscle. So anything pushing against the muscle, just like when you work out and your muscles hurt, it's the same thing. Your uterus will cramp and hurt as the blood pushes against it to push out the clot. Clots are wow. It's a lot. I mean, it's a lot. It is a lot. But I want to go to one of the other ladies that I've been for. I want to speak to Adoma. Um, who had fibroids, she had surgery as well. I want to hear from her. And then I'm going to bring everybody, once I introduce everybody back on the screen. Thank you so much, Doc. Thank you. Guys, if you are watching, make sure that you are sharing your pages because it's really important that this message that we are giving out, everybody gets to hear it. Um, these people, these le young ladies are sharing their stories and it's not everybody that comes out to share their story. And I know that a few of you that are watching have also experienced this. So it's really important that you share your page. Um, you do a watch party if you're on um, Facebook um, and just let everybody know that we're having this conversation. So next I'm going to bring on Aduma. She's in the US at the moment. And um, I want to hear about her journey and, you know, how she's been able to cope with living with fibroid. Adama. Hello. Hey, Thank you so much you? for having me. Thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate that. So sis, tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do and okay. how, you know, when you heard about fibroids. Oh gosh. So what do I do? I do a lot. I'm in everything, but um, for professional wise, I work for the government. I work for the State Department um, as a program analyst, um, but I'm all things women empowerment as to why I was so excited to talk about this, because it's something we need to talk about. So for me, huh, I've always been that individual that has the worst cramps on my first day. I, I can't get out of bed, I can't walk. There was times where I, I wouldn't be able to go to school or go to work, it was that bad. Um, so I was used to that for a while, but in 2014, my cycle started to come in frequently. I would have a cycle for two weeks, a few days would go by, I would have another cycle. And I just wow. felt that was a bit abnormal. And so it went on for a couple months and when I went to visit my OBGYN, I just told her about it and she was like, let's do a few more tests to find out exactly what's happening. When that happened, that's when I was diagnosed with fibroids. So they found four medium sized fibroids and um, hearing that was very devastating. At that time I was 32, so early 30s, it's not something you wanna hear and it's not something of the norm, you know? So my mom never had it, my sister never had it. So it was, it was very shocking. It was hard to actually accept it. Uh, so it took me a while, but I got the surgery that at the end of that year, I got well, you the, surgery. About the surgery. Did you, I mean, did family and friends that don't have the surgery, have herbal stuff? Did you go for anything like that? Or were you just, you know, wanting to do the surgery? No, so actually when I found out about it, I didn't talk to anybody about it. 
I didn't wow. share it because I was just like, I don't even want to claim this. But my sister's a nurse, so she was the first one I spoke to maybe a few weeks later. And she said, you have to take care of it. You know, she's the one that actually pushed me to look into it, take care of it. There's so many treatments and medications about it. So then I talked to my mother, of course, and she she's like, whatever you need to do, because she didn't have it. And neither did my mm -hmm. sister. And so just talk to them. I spoke to my first lady, of course, you know, got prayer and everything. Went and did the surgery, thought I was in the good. Went back to appointments, checkups, everything was okay. In 2017, um, it came back. Wow. So and it can come back. Even if you have surgery, it can come back. It can come back. And it did come back. And my um, OBGYN told me, which I do know. So we have to know our bodies. It's something else that we must know. I eat very poorly. I eat a lot of sugar. I eat a lot of junk food. I don't drink enough water. So I know this. And she told me, you need to change your diet. The first time around, that was the biggest thing. She told me, switch your diet completely and kind of you know, empty out your body so that the fibroids can grow back because there's a potential it will grow back. And the certain foods that I eat will allow it to grow faster. So I didn't do my part the first time around. I know that. Um, but then I try to get better. So 2017, when it came back again, unfortunately, I did not do the surgery. So I am living with them. However, I've been able to control it. I've changed okay. my diet. I'm doing things in a better way. So I'm not experiencing what I was experiencing before. And thank God they came back smaller. They are okay. much, much smaller than they were before. So it wasn't a big scare or a necessity to get them removed. And she did tell me, you know, if you're considering having children, you know, you can work on your own organically and naturally to reduce them. So when you have your children, you know, we can remove them all at one time as a procedure. So I'm going, okay. I'm going through that route of it. And again, like I said, I don't have any issues now. It's just more so in the back of my mind when I'm eating ice cream and the cakes and all of that. And I'm like, okay, I need to change that. Replace my soda with water. That's a challenge, but I'm trying. <laughs> That's hard. Hard. So oh my God. you that, literally have to change your lifestyle because of the fibroids so that they can reduce in size. Yes. So what was That's the first right. size? When you first got the first one removed, what were the, the sizes of them? So to be, I, I do, they try to show it to me and I didn't want to look at them. That's how distraught I was. They gave me the pictures, to be honest, I don't even know where I put it because I think emotionally it was so heavy for me. I just recall seeing them all on the, I guess it looks like a sonogram. Um, mm. I have the copy again, I do have it somewhere, but I did not want to look at it. Again, it was not large. Um, they, I can, you can see my hand. Yeah. They were the they were this size, okay. and it was five okay. of them spread out close to my uterus um, on the bottom end of it. Um, so again, you know, they ask you, do you want to see them after they take them out? And I'm just like, no, I, no I'll pass no. on that. You know, I think just just learning that you've been diagnosed with fibroids can be very heavy to even take in. Um, and again, as a woman in my late 30s, I'm like, well, how do I explain this? Am I going to have to live with this forever? What's going to happen? You know, when I meet someone, I have to tell them this. How, are they going to accept me about, you know, accept me with it? Um, so again, emotionally, I just, I, I blanked out on it mm -hmm. and I tuned it out. Wow. Well yeah. done. Well done you for changing your, your lifestyle, because I think it's something that it's hard, it is hard to do, especially if you're going out with friends and th people are eating certain foods and you're just like, oh my God, I can't have this. Um, it's very, very difficult. Um, but I'm gonna come back to you, Aduma. I'm just gonna go okay. over to Akria, because Akria okay. had five years when she was just 22 years old and had it removed. So right. that's quite young. Um, so I really wanna hear her story and her journey. Thank you so much, Aduma. Thank you. All right. Okay, let's go over to Akria. Hi, Akria. Hi. I think you're on the okay, I can hear you. How are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm good. So you're 23 years old now, right? 
Yes, I am. You're married? Yes. <laughs> you found out after your marriage that you had fibroid, or was it before? It was literally a month after. Wow. Yeah. And what would, I mean, when you said you found out, what were the symptoms that you had that made you realize that it was fibroid? So I've honestly had a heavy period since I started my period. So I never really thought anything of it, heavy bleeding. Um, my mom had fibroids actually, and she had a partial um, hysterectomy. So I had came back from my honeymoon and we went out to eat and I was just cramping really bad for no reason, throwing up my food. So my husband was like, okay, let's go to the hospital and see what's going on. I've always been like sick, like always cramping all the time, even when I'm out of my period. And I was just like, oh, there's always something wrong with me, who cares? So um, he was just fed up. He was like, let's just go to the hospital. So we went to the um, emergency room and my pain was just so bad. Um, and the doctor was like, oh, maybe it's your appendix. Um, when I got to sure I could do a CAT scan. Um, so we waited for a couple of hours to do the CAT scan. And then the guy who did my CAT scan was like, do you believe in God? And I'm like, yeah, like, what's wrong? He was like, just pray. And I'm like, okay, like, what? Am I dying? Like, what's going on? So I, um, I saw the CAT scan because I was in the medical field. And I noticed, like, there's something pretty big that does not belong there. So um, when it was time for them to tell me what was going on, the doctor said that the machines weren't working. So they're not able to give me my results. So they sent me home and they told me that they'd call me the following day and tell me what was going on. So at this point- oh, Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Go home, what were you feeling? Like, because that is just traumatic. I the was, fact that that was said- I was terrified. Like my husband was terrified, I was terrified. I watched a lot of Grey's Anatomy, so I'm like, like, do I have cancer? Like the way the guy said it, I'm like, I'm like, like, what's going on? I'm only 22. Like, I just got married. Like, I'm freaking out. So at this time, it's probably like 5 a.m. So we go home, and then at like 8 a.m., I get a call, and the doctor's like, oh, um, your CAT scan results came back, and you have a mass in your uterus. Um, you have to make an appointment with your doctor, and she can explain it. And that's it. And then she hung up, and I'm like. So I call my mother and I'm like, they found a mass in my uterus. Like, I'm gonna die. Like, this, this, this is it. Like, I don't. Is it cancer? Oh, like, no. <laughs> um, so like we're freaking out. Um, so I make the first available appointment. It was, I think, it was like a Saturday or Sunday. So I made the first available appointment on Monday to see my OBGYN, and she said, oh, it's just fibroids. It's not cancerous. Um, but she did say it was pretty big. It was a 15 centimeter fibroid that was sitting on top of my uterus. Um, and my uterus is like 10 centimeters, so it's basically crushing it. Um, and she, at that point, she was like, okay, well, you have like options. We can do birth control to shrink it. Um, we can try to um, get rid of the whole fibroid. If you want to have kids, you're probably going to have to go through the surgery because the way it's crushing your uterus, no child is going to survive in there. Um, so we decided that we're going to do the surgery. So I actually did the surgery. This happened in September. I did the surgery in October. Um, and they removed the fibroid and she left one of them in there because she said it was at the back of my uterus and she didn't want to do anything to affect like fertility. So I still have one, um, but my cramps have gotten better. I'm not bleeding as heavy anymore. So it has gotten better. Right now I'm living with the fear of that small one growing because of how fast my other one grew. Wow. So you've had to leave one in there because of what, the position that it's in. Yes. Um, she said it was at the back of my uterus. Um, my doctor wanted to make sure that when I do get pregnant, I'm able to have like natural birth. Um, she had said that if she tried to get that one, there is the risk of like cutting into the uterus muscle and not being able to naturally deliver. Um, so she left it with the hope that it won't get as big by the time I have a baby. And at that point, if it does, we'll just take it out with the baby or see what other options I have. Oh, gosh. So have you have you been able to change your lifestyle a bit in terms of are you what are you doing to kind of not let it grow? So until um, I was actually my aunt, so after my surgery, she came over and she brought me like all these fruits and vegetables. And she was like, you have to change your lifestyle. I'm like, I don't like vegetables. I, I don't want to do this. Um, but after that, she told me like, there's a lot of things that you eat that causes them to grow. I did. I cut out a lot of red meat, um, doing better with eating vegetables. Um, I had, I not a big soda person. So that was never a concern for me. I drink water anyways. Um, so I've 
I've tried to change my lifestyle to see if that would help, um, especially with like, you know, trying to get pregnant and stuff after fibroids. And I guess you've had a really supportive partner who has, you know, really supported you in this, which has been very, very helpful by the sounds of it. Yes, um, he was terrified in the beginning because of how everything was going. Um, like even during the surgery, um, he was in the hospital the whole time. Like my mom said he didn't even get up to even eat. Like he was just sitting there waiting for the surgery to be over. Um, the surgery actually took longer than they expected. So he was freaking out. But my husband has actually been very supportive like through the whole process. Um, when I'm on my period, even now, he's just always checking, like, are you okay? Are you cramping? Like, is your period heavy? And I'm like, I'm fine. Like, don't worry. It's okay. I'll let you know if anything's wrong. Um, but he's been very supportive. That's amazing. That's absolutely amazing. And Akri, I'm going to bring you back on. Okay. I want to bring Dr. Dan So on because I want to know how doctors are, you know, telling people that they've got fibroid in such a manner, making it look like it's cancerous and they're going to die or something. Um, so, Dr. Dan So, Doc, you're on mute. Hi, how are you? I'm good, thank you. I'm good. How how are you supposed to tell people when I they've mean, got fibroid? That, I mean, listening to that is just, it's so shocking. I mean, this is, it's all about communication skills. As, as doctors, you know, we, we sometimes un, unwittingly, unexpectedly can be quite blasé about things because we see so many awful things so frequently. But I mean, that's just not how you tell somebody that they have fibroids. You can't let somebody go home not answering, not not knowing how where to go from there. And I think that's why this discussion is so important and why communication is also vital. We need people to be able to ask those questions, feel really empowered to, to not feel like the doctor is here and they're there. No, not at all. I, I always encourage my patients to ask questions so that they're informed because there's something that I know that I may assume that they already know, but it's just not the case. So you've got to really try and be able to have a relationship where they can ask those questions so that they feel that their mind's not just going over and over, worrying the worst case scenario. Doc, so have you come into contact with a lot of um, black women that have, you know, have fibroid and how has it been for them mentally? Yeah, I mean, it's something that I do see a lot. And um, interestingly, I see a lot of older women sort of, I shouldn't say older women, actually, that's quite rude, but women that are sort of coming up to 40 to 50 who have only just found out that they've had fibroids because like some of the other ladies have said, they kind of just dismiss their symptoms of having like heavy painful periods, vomiting, diarrhea, not being able to go to school or go to work. That is not normal. That shouldn't be happening every single month and that shouldn't be ignored. So in terms of mentally, they're, they're actually mentally and physically exhausted. So when it gets to the point where they're coming up to 40, 50 and they found out that they've got fibroids, they, they're just a bit, like, you know, well, I don't really want to have surgery. I don't really want to, I want to know what the other options are, which is understandable. They're, they're almost kind of fed up really, because they kind of got on with it. No one's really at times taking their symptoms seriously. So mentally it's draining. And do you think black people are getting diagnosed, you know, quick quicker than, you know, other cultures? I mean, I mean, no, I mean, I can say that without hesitation. We've seen in the last few months, so many inc incidents where black people just are not getting the health care that they deserve, you know, so they aren't. And that's partly to do with some of some of the cultural aspects that we have within our communities, particularly things like periods and, and other symptoms. It's not something that people always feel comfortable talking about. So that's partly a reason. But also, you know, unfortunately, some healthcare professionals can be quite dismissive towards some of these symptoms that 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 black women have um because of racial bias you know because of of feelings that you know black people don't experience pain the same way that that white people do so there's there's lots of different components to that but simply no we're we're, we're not as, we're not diagnosing these conditions as, as as much in black people as we do in in other races doc why is it that you know when you have surgery usually when you have surgeries to take something out that should be it but it looks like actually the fibroid could come again, but even bigger the next time. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's important to say that that surgery is usually a last resort. Um, 
because with all operations, there are complications. So there are lots of other treatments that we tend to do before we even get to surgery. So um, it's important to stress that. So in terms of it coming back, so fibroids kind of grow and they're, they're hormone based and blood related as well. So anything that triggers the hormones to produce more, like we said, sometimes with um, foods, for example, it can grow. So you've got to try and do everything that you can to make sure that they don't come back. So for example, we know that it's also weight related. You're more likely to have fibroids if you're overweight. And that's something that everybody can do something about. So ensuring that your, your weight is within a healthy range is, is extremely important, not just for fibroids, but for, for general health, you know? So that, that's, that's extremely important too. So you mentioned that surgeries would be the last result. So what are the result? What would you, um, what would be the first thing that you would recommend somebody to do? I mean, I think it's always like a, a, a joint, a joint effort. I always say, I always say, you know, patients try and make sure that they're exercising, lose weight, as I mentioned, trying to, to, to figure out what is what is the worst symptom. That's why that's why I always ask our patients, what's what's the worst thing about this? Is it the pain? Is it the amount that you're bleeding? Is it the nausea? Is it fertility? Because often people don't know that they have fibroids until they start trying. So it's important to kind of treat every individual every patient as a completely in individual person because they all have different things that are bothering them more than others. So um, in terms of figuring out where to go, it, it depends. So for example, women who are trying to fall pregnant, um, you know, you're not going to offer them contraception because yes, that will improve their bleeding symptoms, but they're not going to be able to fall pregnant. So it, it does depend. But in terms of treatment options, we usually use contraception. We can use things like the coil, which I can I can talk about a bit more in detail later or now, if you'd like, just because, again, there are so many um, stories that people hear about the coil. People hear horror stories and, and are not keen to use it. But it's an excellent, excellent treatment option for, um, for heavy, heavy bleeding. Um, yeah. as well. Yeah, no, I think we'll talk about the um, contraception now and I'll bring um, um, Dr. Hawkins on um, when we talk about that. Um, but thank you, Doc. I'm going to go over to our next guest. I'm going to have Anwar on, my Nigerian sister, um, to talk about her journey with fibroid. Hi, sis. You're on mute. You're on mute. Mute. Okay. <laughs> can you hear me? I can hear you perfectly. Thank you so much for joining me on today's show. Um, mm -hmm. And obviously, you've had experience with fibroid. Um, I know you're into um, wellness and health, and you know, even looking at your Instagram page, I know that you take fitness very, very seriously. How was your journey involved in terms of you know having fibroid and getting you know rid of it? Well. Um I had fibroids for a long time. Basically what happened was I was going in for another procedure. Um, I had cervical polyps and I was getting them removed. In the process of them going in and removing the cervical polyps, they were like, you know, you have fibroids. You have four fibroids. And I was like, uh, okay. <laughs> and that was sort of how I knew. But what I will say is that um, ever since I was a kid, like as soon as I started getting periods, my periods were relatively heavy. Um, the cramping was, you know, unbearable at times, but I just learned to live with it. I normalized. And well, when you say your periods were heavy, how many pads were you going for? I just want to, because some people may be having heavy periods, but what is heavy? Is it changing your pads frequently? Like every hour is just totally soaked? Like what is, what is heavy? Well, my heavy was unreal. If I talk about heavy in terms of when they really got bad, I was the first three days I was changing my, because I, I was wearing tampons to start to try to control it. So I was wearing a super plus tampon and an overnight pad. And the first two days, I literally would be changing it every 45 minutes to an hour. Yes. When it got to be unbearable. And it was literally like I was trapped in my house. Like I, or I had to be at a limited time to do what I needed to do because I needed to be back in time or be by a restroom in time to change 
my pads. Like, so it was excessively um, um, heavy. I was clotting really bad um, and the clots were big. And what I noticed is that when I had spoken about it, there were so many other women that talked about that as well. So when I was when I was younger and I was having my periods, I wasn't having as much clotting. It was just heavy. Um, I use, I I actually got on birth control. I was recommended to get on birth control. I was on it for a while, but then after a while of being on birth control, which is I'm I'm really not a huge advocate of it because I honestly believe that it might have exacerbated my situation, made it worse. But, um, you know, after a while, your body just it starts to reject it after a while. So I just was like, you know what, I'm done with this. I got pregnant with my twins. And that's when the fibroid situation came back into you know, to play because the fibroids were there and they were growing with my twins. So I had to be monitored um, to make sure that it didn't become problematic. I was one of the few lucky ones. Like I was one of the lucky ones. I was pregnant, had my babies at 39 weeks. So they were full term, no issues. But when they took them out via C-section, they literally said, you know, it was like with their hand this big, you see this? And they were playing with my stomach and it looked like two baseballs. They said, those are your fibroids. They were like, you need to take care of it. And I think what a lot of us women do is, is that because I was a fitness professional, there was a sense of shame about it because I was just like, why is this happening? Like, you know, I'm healthy, you know, what's going on? So I really did my research and really just wanted to take it under control. I didn't want to immediately do surgery. Um, so of course I just really uh, tried my best to get them under control. I did shrink them initially, you know, I did shrink them and everything else. But what is not often talked about, I heard everybody talk about the fibroids and everything else, is that a lot of times the fibroids are worsened by stress. Stress plays a major impact on the growth of fibroids. And I don't see people talk about it enough. My lifestyle of having twin boys running a very demanding business, not getting enough rest, played a huge part in it. Which is why some people who, you know, have I know vegans that have have fibroids. I know people that are extremely healthy that have fibroids, and they were like, "Why is this happening? I did everything necessary. Why does this keep on happening?" Well, these are one of the major play factors of why sometimes fibroids can grow and can get worse as they do. What I will say is that my mom had fibroids. I had a few aunts that had fibroids. I had a few cousins that had fibroids. I have a sister that had fibroids. So it was pretty common. And doing my research, they kept on saying that the largest instance of fibroids is in West Africa. I don't know why. I'm not sure why West Africa has the largest, uh, um, I guess the largest, I guess, um, incidence of, of fibroids. I have no idea. Wow, why. that's interesting. Wow. They said West Africa. So I thought that was really, really. Is it the jollof rice? Is it the jollof rice? <laughs> I was like, I don't, I have no <laughs> idea. <laughs> but it's extremely common um, in West Africa. So, wow. yes. Yeah, so, you know, when I spoke to my aunts, everybody, and people that I knew, like so many women were going through the same thing I was going through. But after a while, I shrank them. My lifestyle, like I said, being very demanding, they grew back, became unbearable. I was in the ER because, you know, I became anemic, severely anemic. I was bleeding too much. Wow. I started to get, you know, periods twice a month. And I just couldn't take it anymore. It affects your quality of living. It's just not healthy. Like, I, I was miserable. You know, and after a while, I said, you know what? I did everything. I did that route. I went and um, I changed my lifestyle. I did everything. It's still getting worse. Um, so I went and I had a robotic uh, myomectomy. I had a robotic myomectomy earlier this year in February of 2020. So um, everything has been good. The changes I made was that I became pescatari pescatarian um, because... Me, wow, me totally um, 
changing over to veganism wasn't working for me because of the soy. Now, soy has been known to feed a lot of the fibroids, which a lot of people are unaware about. So I adopted pescatarian because that allowed me to stray away from the fleshy meats, which in turns have contained a lot of hormones and stuff like that, which have been known to make fibroids worse. And how, I mean, making that decision, was it difficult? You know what? I, I don't, for me, it wasn't. I mean, I, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm extremely healthy. I'm a master trainer, you know, workout DVDs, great following, everything else. I mean, for me, it was not because I noticed that my body responded better, you know, when I eliminated those elements from my diet. And so everybody's a body is different. But when I remove fleshy meat, now every once in a while in a blue moon, I might have it. But when I remove fleshy meat, which I believe was a major component because I don't, you know, I don't drink soda. I don't drink. I don't, you know, I, I, I really eat, you know, things with a lot of sugar or process and everything else. I just noticed that my body really took to it. So I think that while women are going through this, you know, because for me, I just did not, I don't want to go through that. The likelihood of it growing back is very high, but I'm going to do everything in my power to try to control it and try to prevent it from coming back. So that's, that's what made the decision easier for me. Mm, well done for making that decision. I mean, it's a life changing decision, especially if you, if you were a meat person, if you were, you know, somebody that just, and all of a sudden you've had to cut out all of these things, you know? Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna go over to Tamika um, and I'll come back to you, Anwar. Guys, I hope that you are enjoying the show. As we continue to talk about fibroids, I hope that you are able to share your pages with a loved one. Um, you know, whilst we're getting inspired and educated, it's important that we spread the word and get everybody to listen to this. Um, and so I'm now going to speak to Tamika Gray, who is the founder of the White Project. Um, and so let's speak to Tamika. Hi, how are yeah. you? Thank you for having Hi. me. Thank you for coming on, sis. So tell me a little bit about yourself and your project. Yeah, I'm so excited to do so. So I'm Tanika Gray Valbrun, and I am the founder of the White Dress Project. I'm also a network television journalist. Um, so I really enjoy storytelling and really encouraging women to share their stories because my day job, you know, I've learned that the importance of storytelling is key and it can be so impactful. Um, so the White Dress Project, I'm so excited always to talk about it because it really is, has been an avenue for women to feel encouraged. All of the women today talked about um, so many things that resonated with me, um, having multiple surgeries, sacrificing their quality of life, the mental health component and mental health sacrifices, how we interact with relationships, right? So how do we tell people we're dating? How do we talk to our husbands about this? When we can't hang out with our girlfriends, what does that become? What does that, um, how does that impact our mental health? Um, so I wanted to start an organization where women understood that they did not have to suffer in silence, that they were not in this alone and that their stories mattered. A lot of the women earlier talked about you know, how fibroids can make you feel lonely. Um, and you really are having all of these symptoms in your body that you can't control. And you almost feel like your body has um, abandoned you and you don't have any say as to what's going on in your body. So I wanted to create a space where women understood that since you're not alone, you're not crazy, um, doctors who are dismissing your symptoms, it's not right, but we are here to support you. I personally had uh, two myomectomies to re remove fibroids. My first surgery, I removed 27 fibroids. Um, and my second surgery was done by Dr. Hawkins, who's also on the panel with us um, today. And five- Wait, 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 wait. Tamika, hold on, yeah. please. <laughs> 27. 
27. Yep. And the thing is, I've, I've always been pretty slim. Um, so I was that young lady that always, you know, slim, but always had a protruding belly, always looked like I was pregnant. And for me now, in hindsight, I'm recognizing how much that impacted my self-esteem and how much, um, you know, I just couldn't get over that. And throughout the years, I learned how to camouflage my stomach. I would never wear white because I have always, always, ever since I've, I started my period, I've always had heavy periods. Um, so for me, something like, you know, summer Labor Day parties, wearing white, being social, it just was something that I didn't do. So I, when I started the organization, wanted to use something that for so long had been so negative and had been such a sore spot in my life, I wanted to turn that into something positive. And I understood that for me, it was a white dress. For me, I'm a girly girl, feminine, love dresses, all the time dress up. And for me, I realized that I had sacrificed so much of what I enjoy doing by not wearing white. And you know, some people say, you know, you can't wear white, then wear black. But like I said, for me, it was something I enjoyed. I love clothes and I love dresses and I love to get dressed up. So why should I have to sacrifice um, the things that I like for benign tumors? Um, so that's why I started the organization, to support myself, to support women. And all of the women who shared here today are the women who are in our organization because the, you know, while it's important to recognize that not every woman who has fibroids will experience the heavy bleeding and the pain, a majority of us do. Um, so the white dress resonates with a lot of, a lot of women. Wow. So basically you're encouraged, because I know that, I mean, I have heavy, I haven't been diagnosed with fibro, but I have heavy periods. And one thing I don't like to do is wear white because I'm just so scared. You're right. just so scared you're going to leak. Like you're going to, you know, somebody's, and even when you, you're not even wearing white, you're wearing a different color and you're going out with your girlfriends, you'd be like, guys, can you just check behind me? Because you feel like you may be leaking, but you're not too sure. And um, how do you encourage women to, to think about wearing white? Yeah, so, so it's tough, right? Because the, the truth of the matter is that when you have fibroids, no, all of us don't feel comfortable wearing white. Like I don't feel comfortable putting it on. Every time I put it on, it's still a struggle. You know, you talk about sometimes when you're not even on your fiber, on your period, and you're getting up from a chair and you just want to double check, right? The, a part of that is trauma. Like you've been through it so many times where you've had the accidents. I often talk about in my story that I've never bought a car with cloth seats because I know that you can get stains and blood stains out of leather much easier, right? So it's all of these accommodations that you make. I know every mattress cover that there is to know to mankind. So it's all of these accommodations. It's not wearing white. It's not being social. It's dealing with the up and down mood swings. It's never buying a car with cloth seats. Um, so all of these things are ways that we sacrifice our quality of life. One of the ways I think at the White Dress Project that we encourage women is we say that this is a community. We understand that you are not alone. And all of the people who have talked about today on the panel, sharing their stories and how impactful it has been on their lives, when we mention it, everybody's like, oh yeah, my aunt, my cousin, my sister, everybody, who doesn't have fibroids? And I believe when I started the organization that it shouldn't be like that. We shouldn't just normalize it and relegate it to everybody has it, it's a woman's journey, it's a woman's plight, so we have to deal with it. So we encourage women that if you don't feel comfortable wearing your white dress or wearing white, I'll wear it for you today. So it's that sisterhood, it's that unity, it's that bonding. We're not forcing anyone to wear white, but as I said, we use it as a symbol of positivity and hope 
knowing that us coming together and sharing our stories um, elevates this conversation. So that when we take a day off work for our period, you know, people just aren't thinking that we're trying to chill, right? Or, or just trying to get a day off, but no, this is a serious issue that is impacting so many women. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Tamika. I'm now going to invite all the guests back on. Let me just put everybody back on. Um, okay, fantastic. Um, Doc, I want to speak to my two doctors here. Um, a lot of women also message me, does contraception have anything, side effects to do with um, getting fibroids? I'll start with Dr. Hawkins. So that's actually very controversial, right? Okay. Because contraception is hormones for the most part when we're talking about contraception is synonymous with either progesterone or a combination of progesterone and estrogen. And there's research out there that shows very strongly that estrogen stimulates fibroids. So then the question is, is the estrogen that's found in contraceptive pills or implants or whatever, enough to actually trigger trigger fibroids. If our own estrogen is enough, any estrogen that we're adding in addition to our system, is that also going to be damaging or harmful to us? There's also research that looks at progesterone. They did rat studies very um, many, many years ago that looked at progesterone only and said that there's a possibility that just progesterone alone can stimulate fibroids. And we in the scientific community all have our kind of theories that we kind of, you know, um, will migrate towards. So it's the answer that I would love to say is um, a hard cut yes or no. I personally and my patients that have fibroids try to avoid hormones if I can. I may add it on the back end after I've taken care of their fibroids um, via some type of treatment. And then the the truth of the matter is that hormones early on can also help slow down the heaviness of the bleeding and the symptoms of fibroids. So then what position does it have to play for someone? Do you just let them suffer because you don't want to give them hormones or they don't want to take hormones and nothing else is a true option for them? Um, so it's very, it still is very controversial. Absolutely. Um, Doc, Dan, so do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I, I think I think that's completely true. The, the jury's out on that really. But, but what I will say, I will stress is that there's kind of like two ways to look at it. So there's, there's, there's treating the symptoms of fibroids and then there's removing the fibroids. So the, the hormones are actually, you know, we can use them. And, and in the UK, we do use that first line um, to reduce the symptoms related to fibroids. But, but And then, you know, after that, then there's removing fibroids. So hormones don't actually get rid of the fibroids. They just kind of help with the symptoms associated with with fibroids. Okay, Chrissy, can I have that question back on the screen, please? Um, Dr. Hawkins, can you read this one? So what other options will women um, who want to have children do? What other options do they have? So that's the thing, that's the catch 22 about it. If you want to have good, effective contraception, then you have to have good, effective contraception. <laughs> you have to have some type of hormones. Now they have lesser hormones that have lower doses. We have one here called Lolo. There's intrauterine devices, which I think may be the same thing as the coil. Yeah. Okay. Which I'm a fan of. And um, if you have fibroids, you may be a candidate for it. It really depends on where the fibroids are. If they're in your cavity, your doctor might be hesitant about putting an intrauterine device because of, you know, complications that can arise from that. But that's an option as well. And that's the lesser dose of hormones. There's Nuva rings again, lesser dose of hormones um, may fare better for these individuals. The catch 22 is that sometimes you need higher dose to actually help with the heavy bleeding or actually get a tighter control of the um, symptoms of the fibroids. But you have to do what you have to do. Condoms aren't necessarily reliable. Barrier contraceptives are not necessarily, you know, reliable. The rhythm method certainly is not reliable. So <laughs> what do you do yeah. for these patients? Mm -hmm. I think I think the end of the question was just kind of what do you what are the options? I mean, the other thing is if the if the fibroid is located in an area that's going to affect fertility, then we would certainly look at removing that. Mm -hmm. But but I also want to stress again that 
having fibroids doesn't mean that you're infertile. That, that definitely is the case. We've heard some, you know, wonderful stories of, of people conceiving and having twins, I heard, I think, earlier. I mean, it just goes to show that it doesn't mean that at all. And I think that's one of the biggest myths surrounding fibroids. It just, people just assume that they can't have children and that's just, just not true at all. Okay. Um, um, and why did you have contraception by any, any chance? Were you using that? I was using the contraception earlier on, right before I had my twins. You know, as I was using the contraception, because they were like, I kept on complaining about the heavy periods. So, of course, they used that to control the periods, the, the heavy bleeding. Um, of course, like, after a while, my body just started to reject the, you know, yeah. the the birth control and they tried to switch it and my body just wasn't responding well. So I just said, forget about it. Two years later, I had the twins. I mean, not twins, but I got pregnant and um, you know, they grew with the baby. I did use contraception. I used it for eight years. I used it for a long time. And so just to be quite honest with you, after I had the twins and you know, the, ble the bleeding sort of resumed, they tried to put me back on birth control. And I went on the Morena and I just, I don't know, your body sometimes, everybody is different because there are people that I know that had positive results. But when I went on the Morena, it was a nightmare. You know, I was having all the side effects, you know, the crazy thoughts, you know, depression, bloating, it was just crazy. So I said, I, I, I'm just not gonna get on anything. So I, I removed myself from, um, with the birth control. And like I said, um, I think she also mentioned the whole thing about um, you know, people's, you know, I guess issues with birth control. I mean, that's, that was sort of my reservations with birth control because I believe it exacerbated. I believe it made it worse. And that's just my opinion about it, you know? And so, you know, people have talked about even veganism. I'm not a complete fan of veganism because of, there's not many options. I'm a fitness professional, you know, and I can't really have soy. I truly believe that soy also makes fibroids worse. So I adopted pescatarian as a, he a healthy medium. So I think you have to find what works for you, but I've done a lot of research. I've also worked with doctors. It's good to see more African-American doctors because you know everybody else is quick to send you, you know, under the knife. They didn't give you too many options. It was always like take birth control and I just was not for it after my experience. I will add that anatomy is Has anybody much. else on the on the platform had to use um, any pills or anything? Um, I was on Depo for a year, um, but then I chose to get off of it because I actually wasn't Go getting on um, I was saying that I was on the Depo shop for like over a year, um, but I decided to get off of it because I also heard like being on birth control for so long can cause fertility issues. So I chose to not do birth control at all. But my doctor did recommend for me to go back on birth control when we find out about fibroids, and that really wasn't an option for me either. Mm -hmm. Doc, so being on the pill, can it can it slow down your fertility? I mean, what happens with when you take um, contraceptive pills for a long period of time? Do you want me to go first? That's fine. Oh, okay. Okay, so um, with regards to the pill, I think again, this is one of the myths associated with contraception. So there's actually no evidence that suggests that the oral contraceptive pill and the Mirena pill actually affect your fertility. The only contraception that takes time, for example, so the depo injection or the depo shot as it was referred to, it takes, if you're on that, it takes roughly a year before your fertility comes back to normal. But with all the other contraception, it does not affect your fertility. No matter how long you, you, you've been on that. Correct. Miss a few days and you can be okay. pregnant. All right. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> but the depot, it can take that long, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I was on Okay, all right, it. Chrissy, you had a question. Okay, Chrissy, can I have that question that you had up, please? 
And do we think that, Doc, is there, do you find that women are stigmatized as a result of being diagnosed with fibroids? Stigmatized in what way? Oh, um, being, because people don't want to talk about it. Okay. And why is it that they don't want to talk about it? Is it, is it a stigma behind it? You know, that you've got these kind of like tumors or sometimes somebody even had a scan and looked like a baby, you know, um, that's growing in you. And so there's some type of stigma that, you know, that's, is, that's involved in it. Yeah, I mean, go ahead. Has any of the ladies, you know, come feel? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I can definitely say there is stigma attached. Um, I, I do a radio show on GN Radio, um, and the number of women that call who have had fibroids for several years, not spoken to anybody, is is alarming. Um, and I think it really is because there is a perception that having fibroids means that you're going to have problems with conceiving. Um, and and that, that's just not that's just not true for the most part. So I, I do think there is stigma attached, particularly within um, the African community, um, and I, I see it all the time. I, I've seen I've seen women who will come in and ask specifically for a scan to check that everything is okay because they're going to get married and they want to know whether there is something that's gonna that's gonna be a problem in the future. So there is stigma attached, and and, and I think that's un, undoubted, undoubted really. I completely agree with that. Yeah. I just, Adama, what do you think? Um, I absolutely agree with that. I think immediately when someone hears that you have fibroids, their first question or what they what comes to mind is, oh, are you going to be able to have children? I've had ever since speaking about it and being a bit more open, that's the first question that they that I do get is, OK, so well, did they say you can have children? And I tell them, I have to quickly correct them and say, it's not going to affect that. You know, if I'm taking the, the right right steps to correct it, I will be able to have children. So there's this big stigma that women with fibroids won't have children, or I feel like there's this mark that's put on you, especially when it comes to men. They, they have this fear of wanting to get to know you because of the fear of you not possib possibly being able to have children. Mm, mm, mm. Tamika? Yeah, I completely agree with both of those comments. That's the reason we started the organization because I wanted women to understand that no, you don't have to feel ashamed, feel like you've caused this upon yourself, feel like you put these tumors inside you um, and you should share your story. Like you know, forget about all of the taboo. And it's not even just about fibroids, it's, it's issues below the belt, reproductive health issues. We just don't want to talk about them. And somehow we feel that it um, prevents us from having children. We don't wanna talk about in dating situations. Um, so it absolutely has a stigma that comes with it. And that's what we're trying to eliminate because all the things that are wrong with men, they talk about them and we love them anyway. So I feel that we should also be just as open so that we can get um, the treatment that we need. We can get legislation, appropriations, funding, commercials, marketing campaigns, so that no, it's not a big deal. Half the population is bleeding. We gotta get over it. Oh, fantastic. Anwa, I know that you had your hand up. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the important reasons why I decided because I was very big. I was suffering in silence. I was really going through it. And I think that after a while, there's just a stigma because I was a, a master trainer. I'm this health professional and everybody looked up to me for these things. And it's like this, I believe, would initially I thought it would become problematic for me to come out and share it. But once I had the twins, I don't know, it, it, something in me was like, this is, this is bigger than me because, you know, I had twins. And when I would go on forums, the number one thing you would hear is women's concern about fertility, about having children, about the possibility, can I have kids? And so I thought it was very important. It was like, sort of like the light at the end of the tunnel. Look, I have, I had twins, you know, with five boys. <laughs> they grew with the babies now, but I had, and so once I came out, it was, I mean, overwhelming. 
that women are like, oh, okay, you know, okay, you can have kids, you know, it's possible. I'm like, my mom had five boys, you know, my sister had five boys. We, we all have kids, <laughs> you know, it, it is very possible to have it. I think that stigma behind it because it's not talked about. And like I said, it's a, it's a very depressing situation um, to be in, you know, and I'm glad that we have forums like this so we can share it because I think that's our main concern. And also you just don't want to go into a relationship feeling like, you know, because people are not as educated about the topic. So now it's sort of like, you know, when they when you're in a relationship, I, you know, seen a lot of forums, a lot of people's biggest concern is like, you know, the men are like, uh, can you have kids? That's what they think. And that's what I initially mm -hmm. thought myself before I had my twins. So mm -hmm. I think more women, and it's a lot of us, a lot of women have children. Mm -hmm. I think more and more, more of us come out, it can give, you know, some way to these kind of conversations. Absolutely. And so, um, Dr. Hawkins, does the panel have any comments on the suggestions that hair relaxers cause um, fibroids? I remember reading a study very specifically looking at that, um, that basically talked about the paraffins and some of the um, additives that are in a lot of the cosmetic things that we use very specifically hair relaxers and that those... Um, so I won't use the word poison. <laughs> Those additives um, mm -hmm. actually will seep into our system and can be harmful to um, our uterus, our cells, and, and have these uh, effects that can help fibroids grow. So there have been studies that actually have looked at that very specifically. They weren't large studies. They weren't randomized studies. They weren't studies that, from a scientific perspective, we'll see in the New England Journal of Medicine. However, they looked at a very important topic for the African-American community, and it did show some connection. You know, there, there, there are many connections to pesticides, to preservatives, to canned foods, to processed foods. And we've already talked about on this panel, red meats, beef and pork, and the amount of additives that are put inside of that, um, that we know are not good for our overall generalized health, but certainly are not good for our womb health either. That's why many of us have gone natural. <laughs> that is specifically why I went natural. I had fibroids and after my fibroid surgery, I did everything that everyone else on this panel did, including I stopped relaxing my hair. Wow, wow, wow. <sighs> Latoya, I want to come to you. When you're getting to know someone new, do you try to be open with your past experiences with fibroids? And how do you go about that? Um, not everyone. Maybe if it's someone I really like, then I will, or if it's getting serious, then I will explain. Because sometimes you don't want to be telling all, your all and then it just doesn't work out. So I've, I've been protective of that. Um, even before, when I first got diagnosed, it was my brother I called because I was so devastated. Like I literally, when the gyne when the gynecologist told me it's a fibroid, it's in the pregnancy sack again, dark thoughts started coming. Like I'm not going to be able to get pregnant. Who's going to want me? Things like that. So as soon as I got into my car, I literally cried on the phone to my brother because that time. His fiance was pregnant with my niece. She's four now, but at the time, I think they just didn't know what to do or even behave around me as the years went by. So I've always said, if it's someone that I deem that's gonna be serious, then I will say, this, this is a situation. But most of the people I've dated and things like that, because of having period pain, like every month, it's like I'd, plan my days or plan events around my period so for example if a friend was having a birthday or family members oh i oh my birthday is in two weeks time i'd be like oh my period comes around that time so i'm not sure if i'll be able to attend and i just attend and i just used to think that's not normal because i know every period the first two days was bad rolling over the floor vomiting um sweating it was it was really mad and it was crazy and i'd cry every pre i was i used to be afraid of my period like i don't know if any of you guys have felt that way but if i know my period's coming it was a fear that i just did and so it made me depressed at the time i didn't think it was depression but looking back now it was depression i didn't want to go out i used to say to my 
cousins. Oh, I just want my room out. I don't care anymore because it was just really bad and it was mentally draining. Um, the heavy bleeding, because I'm slim anyway, the heavy bleeding caused me to have anemia. So I lost a lot of weight as well. I'm already slim, so losing weight. So people would see me and be like, oh my gosh, Latoya, what happened? But I'm not going to tell everyone that I'm dealing with fibroids. It's just the ones that know, okay, she's, you know, she's anemic. So it's loss of blood. That's why she looks so slim. So my weight used to fluctuate up and down, up and down. Some people gain weight, but I was the opposite, always losing weight. Yeah. Can any of you, um, you know, testify to that, you know, the fear of having your period every month? I don't mind, did you, because I saw you nodding your head. Was it something that you also experienced? Absolutely. Um, the pain is so bad that I, I just didn't want to deal with it. So, yeah, there was a fear. And with mine, I, at times I don't know when it's coming. So the fear of it just randomly showing up with extreme pain and just, knowing that I can't really control it. Um, I was supposed to take only three ibuprofens at a time. I usually take five. I hate to say that because it's not healthy, but the pain is that bad. So I definitely have nightmares. I'm always going through my calendar like, oh, it's going to be here next week. Let me start. So I prep in advance taking the pills for it. And just like Latoya, I'm skinny and framed. So at times I have this belly that's just there, you know, that it's very painful. So even trying to deal with that and wearing nice clothes um, can be an issue. So just the fear of that, trying to work around all of that, putting on two spanks to look normal. So <laughs> there's a few, few things when it comes to the cycle. Mm -hmm. uh, and then did you ever have like people say, oh, you look pregnant, are you pregnant? Like yes. how does that also feel? Um, so I call it my food baby um, <laughs> because at times, you know, I don't want to talk to people and tell them, well, I'm dealing with, it's just too much to even explain. But yes, even if I eat and if around my cycle, if I eat a lot, if I eat a little, my stomach will inflame to seven months, full blown baby stomach looks like I'm pregnant. <laughs> and so there are definitely times where one specific incident, I went out with a cousin to a networking event. I had a very tight outfit on. And I told myself I will not eat. The food was so good. So I did eat. And by the end of the evening, I had people asking me, oh, are you expected? I didn't know you were pregnant. What? When did this happen? I'm just like, oh, no, it's just my food baby. That's it. <laughs> the food baby, the food compressed, you know, next to the fibroids that causes to inflame. So I'm used to it now. Wow. Tamika, I saw you nodding your head as well. Do you have anything to add? Yeah, that story is so real and it like resonates with me so much. Like her story, Latoya's story, like all of these stories resonate with me so much. And it's, it's the stories that we hear often. I'm also pretty slim. And every time I eat, it's the same thing. My belly protrudes. And, you know, we often talk about just minding your own uterus like mind your own <laughs> business don't ask women when they're having babies don't ask them if they're pregnant it's just it's just not appropriate um yeah. but it also speaks to how much your your belly can protrude when you have fibroids and you eat or when you have fibroids and bloating is a symptom of fibroids um so yeah i those stories resonate with me so much i wanted to just touch on what latoya said about the fear of having your period every month. It's its the same premise of the white dress project. Like you, you just don't wear white. You, you're so fearful of what's going to happen every time your period is on. And that's just something that causes trauma. And the mental health component of all of this is something that I think we should all talk about more because all of us have touched upon how this has impacted us mentally. Um, so I, I just want to applaud Latoya for speaking up about that because it's so true that you go through these cycles and you just isolate yourself because you're fearful. Yeah, yeah. And I, I want to come to, um, to Doc, um, Dr. Hawkins about that aspect of things. I know you see a lot of women with fibroids. How do you get them to deal with the mental health aspect of things? 
Yeah. I mean, for me personally, as a physician, I find that women are empowered by just releasing, just venting, just telling their story, giving their um, truth to their doctors about how they feel about what they're going through. You know, these are the symptoms. And of course, we have specific questions that we want to get out of them so we can curtail the treatment plan and their options to them specifically. But I do think, um, as Tanika has said over and over again, them telling them their story is impactful. You know, I keep a box of Kleenex very close to me because I'm a crier and also close to my patients because you'll find that in that what they what what I hope that they feel like is a safe space, they will release it all. Um, it's it's empowering because the mental health piece of it is not discussed. It's not something that we were taught to put into our review of systems when it came specific to fibroids. You know what I mean? However, um, as everyone has discussed, the fertility aspect is important, right? If they're of a certain age, the age there are and the fear that they won't be given all of their options or even sometimes the experience that, they, that they've had with other physicians, other physicians who haven't given them options or have told them no or have told them a hysterectomy is their only option. I get a lot of that as well. And it took them five years to even come back and see another doctor because of the concerns and the trauma that they had from that um, experience where they felt dismissed. So as, as physicians, I know um, that the ones of us who actually care, especially about this component of women's health, that time that they spend with us to release and actually um, tap into the mental health component is very, very, very important, extremely important. And that's why I think it's important that we participate in these type of forums, that we educate, that we talk to our communities, that we talk to our husbands. When husbands come, they're not just coming to ask me questions about sex. <laughs> you know what I mean? They are asking questions about sex and fibroids, but they also want to know what's going on with my partner. Why is she feeling like this once a month? What can I do to help her? All of that is very empowering for us as women. Yeah, but Docs, are you seeing a lot of men supporting the women as well? Are they coming to the clinics with them? Or so, are the majority shying away from it? Uh, the majority shy, but not necessarily because um, they wouldn't. Sometimes we don't give them the invitation to, right? Sometimes we don't talk to our partners about our um, below the belt topics when it comes to menstruation. We don't want to, we don't feel comfortable doing so. They show up at the surgery. You know, I'm, I'm a surgeon. So pr primarily people that come see me are at their wits end and they're ready for a surgical intervention. They'll show up then. And when I show them the pictures and say, this is what she had inside. This is what was going on. This is why she said, you know, how she was feeling and she wasn't just being lazy or trifling or whatever you thought. Then they are. Then they kind of, you know, the light bulb goes off. So they a lot of times will get on board when they get to the point where they feel like their their wife or their girlfriend or whoever it is has made a decision to do something. Um, I would like to see more men help in pushing us in that direction. But we first have to let them in. Mm, so a lot of them are not actually letting the men in because they just want to do it by themselves. Mm -hmm. Or they're concerned about everything that everyone has stated here today. Mm -hmm. I was diagnosed in my first year of marriage, and my number one concern was my husband didn't sign up for this. Mm. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> he didn't sign up for this. Right. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, so. And I guess that's what Akia you went through. I mean, you got married at 22. In your honeymoon, you're finding out that this thing is happening to you. I mean, how is that? Like, how is that feeling like? So it was embarrassing, mostly because even before we got married, um, I had a pap smear done and my doctor said like I had abnormal cervical cells. So like my husband and I have been going through like things like below the belt conversations. We had it before we got married. Um, and it's always been hard to like to go to him was easier than to go to my family members. So I've always had his support 100 percent, no matter what I was going through. Um, he pushes me to see the doctor more than I personally want to. Um, when my period was bad, I don't want to go to work. He's like, go to the doctor. I'm like, no. They're going to tell me the same thing they've been telling me since I was 16. It doesn't make a difference. So my husband has been very supportive, and he's the one who pushed me to go to the emergency room to begin with because I would have just passed it off as, oh, it's just something that I've been going through for so long. So I'd never really paid attention to any of that stuff. 
And many of our husbands are supportive uh, if we give them the chance to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. But it's, it's 22. Isn't that 22 a very young age? Or have you seen younger people? Have you seen any younger people, Dr. Dunce or Dr. Hawkins, come into your surgery to say that they have um, fibroids? I mean, yeah. So, I mean, fibroids are associated, you know, one of the, I wouldn't say causes, but we know that people that start their periods much earlier are more likely to have fibroids. So with that said, you are going to have, you know, we're seeing, you know, we're seeing people as young as nine, ten starting their period. So, we are we are seeing younger and younger people having having fibroids, which is why I, I can't stress enough that you, you, nobody, you know, if there are mums watching, if, if the sisters, aunties, and and you know, you know, someone that's having you know symptoms of painful, heavy periods, where you know we've heard somebody's women that's completely debilitating. That is not normal. You should not have to go through that every single month for the rest of your life. No. You need, and it's your body way of telling you something is up. So that's how you need to seek help and see what's going on. So don't ignore those symptoms at all. Just take it really seriously. I started my period at eight, the age of eight years old. Same. Who said so? I started my period pretty early. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Really? Wow. And yeah. that was traumatic for for me and even now my daughter's eight and i'm just i'm praying every day that god please don't let her start her period because at that age like i remember being at school and i thought i was dying so my mom had never spoken to me about periods before and i remember my belly was hurting i went to the toilet and I was like, I'm dying. I was screaming because I just saw blood. I was like, I'm dying. I'm dying. And the next person I was in the toilet went to get the teacher. And the teacher came and said, no, you're not dying. It's, it's, it's your period. I was like, oh, my God, period. What's that? And, you know, my mom came to get me. And I remember every month I hated going to school because I knew that I would leak. Because I couldn't control it. I was a sporty person. I was, you know, and it was just a very traumatic time for me as a young person so you know anybody that starts their period at a young age is, is, is already very traumatic and hard to control as a young person so oh my goodness okay right so I think now we are going to start taking questions we have 30 more minutes to go I know that a lot of you have um, asked a lot of questions so Chrissy I know that you had a question up I'm so sorry if you can put it back up so we can start rolling with the questions that people have Well, it looks like a lot of people had their periods at a young age as well. Um, I think the person mentioned about supplements, uh, supplements like natural supplements. Are they good to use, Dr. Dancer? Um, I mean, supplements are a big, big thing at the moment. People are more aware of their bodies and what to take. Um, what I will say is that the majority of people don't actually need supplements. If you're having a really good balanced diet where you're eating extremely well, you will get everything from the food. Um, but there are there are specific vitamins which we all should be taking. Vitamin D is one of those things. So I would I would strongly recommend that people, if you're not on vitamin D, get on vitamin D. Um, in terms of uh, sort of period protection, I would say that again, making sure that you're having iron rich foods. There are some people who, for whatever reason, cannot absorb iron or from their from their diet. So um, an iron supplement would be recommended. But again. I would strongly advise speaking to your own GP or your, your OBGYN before you start any supplements because sometimes it's just not necessary. Mm -hmm. Okay, Dr. Hawkins, are there natural ways to get rid of with um, rid of um, fibroids? There are no natural ways to get rid of them. It's very hard to um, get rid of them once they're there. The only way to remove fibroids is to remove. Fibroids. However, there are lots that can be done from a natural perspective to help with the symptomatology, to help with even sometimes the flow and the pain and the cramps that are coming with fibroids, trying to eliminate some inflammation naturally in our bodies um, to get rid of, as people have said before, soy, um, dairy, gluten-rich foods can add inflammation to our system and overall just not help us feel well. 
And I've definitely had patients and I've spoken with naturopathic physicians who will say that adjusting those things in the diet and like Dr. Danson said, just literally eating a healthy I'm very colorful, very plant-based diet can give you all that you need. So there are supplements that are out there, chase tree, um, ginger, turmeric, um, that can be helpful, but usually just in the symptomatology, but they're not, they're not getting rid of fibroids. And I always tell my patients to be very wary of individuals who are charging thousands of dollars to take this detox or take this tea or do this herbal package and get rid of your fibroids and they'll naturally eliminate from your system. Um, Because remember, what you're not going to get rid of is your ovaries and your uterus. And that's all that you need to make fibroids. So (laughs) are you really turning that off? And then the other caution there is, what are you doing to offset your hormones when you take some of these supplements? What about the medications that you're taking that are for your other general health? If you're taking blood pressure medication, diabetes medication, other things that are that are um, prescribed. Yes, they may be considered westernized medicine, but for good reason, they're prescribed. Are these supplements affecting those? Or are these supplements possibly doing you harm by offsetting something that is essential for other functions of your body? So supplements are not something I tell my patients you can't do. I just tell them to have caution when they're doing it. Make sure that they read their bottles and their labels. And you know, I don't I can't necessarily recommend one or the other because the scientific data is not there, but be careful. The only thing I would add that I didn't mention actually is exercise. Um, exercise is actually proven to, to reduce your symptoms of painful heavy periods. Now, when you're on your period, nobody really wants to exercise. But in fact, it's actually proven. So even a gentle brisk walk um, is advisable. Um, some people say swimming. I think practicalities, many people on the period don't really want to go swimming. But all of these things, yoga is also a fantastic exercise to try to try and kind of release a lot of tension as well. So exercise is a great is great anyway, but if you're having heavy tension periods, trying to do some good stretching and yoga is advisable. Okay. Um, to the panel, Dr. Hawkins, can you take this question? So the, the HRT, hormone replacement therapy, does it contribute to the formation of fibroids? Been on hormone replacement therapy for over a year. How um, do I make sure I'm not affected? So hormone replacement therapy, usually when we speak of hormone replacement therapy, we're usually talking about a postmenopausal woman and hormone replacement therapy. And believe it or not, the hormone replacement therapy, the amount of hormones that are there are much less than we actually naturally produce in our premenopausal years. And after menopause, you are no longer making an amount of natural estrogen that should be affecting your uterine and the cell, your uterus and the cells to produce fibroids. So there's not a lot that is thought to be um, additive with hormone replacement therapy in a postmenopausal woman that should cause their fibroids um, to grow, but it can cause some persistence of symptoms and it certainly can inhibit the natural shrinkage that should come after menopause. So for postmenopause, I've seen postmenopausal women who are on hormone replacement therapy to help with their menopausal symptoms that will have spotting, which just leads to other concerns and issues. Is this cancer? We got to work that up. But in reality, it's just that the fact that they're still feeding their body um, estrogen and is stimulating these fibroids. So unlikely to make them grow or to grow new ones because it's just not a high enough amount to do so, but it can um, stimulate ones that are there if you're not careful. So hormone replacement therapies can kind of mix up the pot for a postmenopausal woman. Okay. Um, um, I have had, I have never had cramps since I started my period at age of 13. I never had symptoms, only got diagnosed in 2018 after reporting a bloated belly. Surgery has been recommended and I'm really anxious. Your advice, especially to the, um, I don't know, uh, Latoya or Tanika that, you know, you've been through this. What would your advice be for somebody that's really anxious about having surgery? Well, I would definitely say get multiple opinions. Um, I always talk about, you know, finding a doctor is really like dating. If you don't find someone who is invested in you, who is um, wants to meet the same outcomes that you want to have, 
then you got to keep it moving. Like that's not the person for you. And I often look at my doctors and the health practitioners who are in my life. And I say to them, are, are you serving me that way? Because I do believe that it should be a partnership and not just um, they tell me what to do and that's it. Um, so for someone who is anxious about surgery, I would definitely say to seek multiple opinions. And as someone else suggested on the panel earlier, you really have to be clear about what you want your outcomes to be, right? So not every woman wants to be a mother. So there are certain routes that you take if, if that's not the case. If you do want to be a mother, then there are other routes that you take. So being clear about the outcome that you want and then gathering all the data from, from multiple opinions. Okay, anybody want to, Latoya? For me, um, so my first operation, I had a lady and the aftercare, she was just terrible. Like how she treated me. So I was just, I said to myself, I actually don't want to, although she did the operation, everything went, it's just her aftercare was really bad. Like the second time I went to see her. So from there, when I got diagnosed again in 2019, they did recommend her to me. And I said, because of how she treated me the last time, I really, so I was anxious because I felt like there was no other gynecologist um, surgeons to help me. So there was this nice, like Tanika said, it's, obviously asking for different opinions, different. So I did research a doctor who was a male doctor mm -hmm. and who was amazing. And he was an African man, he was amazing. Even I was still scared and anxious because this is the second time. Although I've done it before, you're still scared because you just don't know. And I hate going under. And I just said to myself, this is the last time I'm gonna have an operation. I don't have kids. So I don't wanna go back to the hospital until God gives me kids. Do you know what I'm saying? And so, like Tanika said, weigh your options, seek different kinds of gynecologists, Re research them because they can be on the hospital mm -hmm. website. So that's good. If you just try it and then, again, if that's the last resort, then do the operations. I had to do the two operations because the first one was in the pregnancy sack, which was dangerous. So they did say you would have to do that because if you want children, you will miscarry every time the way it's placed. And the second time was in the uterus, where they said, again, having babies, it could grow the baby, you know, I could, so they just said, remove that. That's why I did those operations. I feel like if they weren't in those places, I don't think I would have had the operation, but they were in bad places. So I had to have them and they were fine each, yeah. Okay. Um, I, would, I just want to make a, another quick suggestion that um, when you're going through this, it is a, an anxious time. You are really, really scared. I've had two surgeries and I still have fibroids. So you deal with that. Like you feel like you've done everything you can and you still have fibroids. What I would say to women um, feeling alone is find your tribe. Find the community of women who support you, who you can talk to, who you know, is not the girlfriend that's like, girl, just take Advil and relax and call me next week. Like, that's not the tribe I'm talking about. I'm talking about people who will understand and recognize that you are going through something, that your pain is real and support you. Mm -hmm. You can, you know, do it yeah. on, there are lots of Facebook groups that talk about fibroids, there are forums like this. So find your tribe. Who can you talk to? Because like Dr. Hawkins said earlier, speaking about this and the storytelling piece of this and releasing it from your body is a part of getting to our healing. Absolutely. Um, so somebody has on the screen, my daughters are having very bad period pains. Do you recommend them getting a scan for fibroids? Um, what I would say is that I guess it depends on, on their ages because, yeah, it completely depends on their ages and also their symptoms. It's quite normal to have quite heavy painful periods just as you start your periods and also coming towards the end of your periods, so the two extremities. Um, what I would say is it's not just, it's just not, not just fibroids, there are lots of other causes of heavy periods. So I definitely would recommend 
um, seeing a doctor or a GP or a UK for, for some more advice. And also, like I think, yeah, Latoya mentioned, you know, bleeding really heavily can make you anemic. And we commonly see anemia in young people um, usually presenting or their first symptom is that they've painted at school or they're sleeping through class. So again, shouldn't shouldn't be ignored at all. So definitely seek help for that. Thank you. Um, before I take the next question, Anwa, how long were your period days? I know that you had very heavy periods. How long was it? Seven days? Were you having longer periods? How long were your days? Well, I would say um, the first two days, of course, I mean, I feel like a majority of anything that was supposed to go on with my period happened those first two days when I was changing my pad and tampon literally every 45 minutes to an hour. And so my periods usually lasted completely about four to five days when they were like that. Um, so my periods weren't as long, um, but it wasn't until after I had the book, when they started the fibroids, I guess got worse. Um, I was getting periods twice a month. But um, and at that point I was having it for seven, eight, eight days. But primarily, it it lasted for about four to five days. But it was just the two days. It's like it, the quality of living was impossible. I mean, who, you, you're changing your pad and tampons every forty five minutes. It's only but so much that you can do during that time. So usually, like most of the other panelists, I was scheduling. I mean, I'm in the business, and usually I would not take on jobs if it was during my period of time. I would try to even give myself a couple of days before because sometimes it come a little bit earlier, a couple of days afterwards, and be like, you know what, I can't commit to that. Like, it, yeah, it was four to five days, but like I said, like it was just those couple of first few days that were just unbearable. And of course, I was anemic, and um, eventually, you know, it just I couldn't keep up with the blood loss, and I ended up in ER. So, you know. Wow. Wow. Aduma, did you have long periods? Because I have, so is, is having seven day periods, is that normal? Because I have seven day periods. Um, yes, uh, for me, that's very normal because sometimes I can go up to 10 days. Um, it just would vary. Uh, the very first time around, I was, I actually had a cycle that lasted two and a half weeks. That was the longest one. And then a few days later, it came back. So long cycles i'm pretty used to those yeah and and that's normal to me okay doc is that normal dr hawkins is seven days ten days is that normal from a textbook definition no that's not normal from a textbook standard um they would quote and say that a normal menstrual cycle is five days or less and less than eight 80 milligram, 80 milliliters or 80 cc's of blood. The cup that the, you go and receive when you go to the doctor's appointment to leave a urine sample is 100 cc's. So less than that for the entire period will be considered from a textbook definition of normal cycle, which many of us on the first day of a heavy day of our cycle will do that when we wake up in the morning. You know what I mean? So can you imagine if you're losing in excess of what is quote unquote normal, you're losing pints of blood sometimes with each menstrual cycle. That is how you end up being so anemic and so profoundly anemic for some of us that will have fatigue and headaches and um, syncope episodes and um, loss of productivity because we're losing way too much blood for our body to actually compensate and keep up with. So no, it's not normal. It's not normal at all. But, you know, I wouldn't say that if your cycles were light and they lasted for seven days to run to the doctor and scream, you know, that everything is coming to an end. Um, because I think there's variation in medicine and we as individuals will have various experiences with our cycle. But from a textbook definition, it's not normal. 10 days, you're pushing okay. it. 10 days is <laughs> Can, I, and I do want to say it is not normal. It was normal to me before my first surgery. So I don't want anyone to think I, <laughs> I think it's normal because it's not. But back then I was so used to it. It was my normal yes. until I got mm -hmm. it fixed. Mm -hmm. Is it dangerous to remove fibroids while having a C-section? Yes. <laughs> so pregnancy is a state of... Um, your uterus is preparing for um, delivery. 
your body is constantly preparing to deliver this baby. So it becomes very engorged your uterus and it had the blood flow and the blood supply from your body is shunted towards your uterus, especially in preparation for C-sections. That's why someone will lose up to a liter of blood during a C-section and bounce right back. I had two C-sections, bounce right back because your body is preparing for that. However, when you have fibroids in addition to that, that also sequester a lot of blood flow, it can be very dangerous for you to, to have those removed because it could increase risk of hemorrhage beyond what would be considered normal or enough for your body to compensate for. So usually we would avoid um, by all means possible avoiding, I mean, removing fibroids during a time of a C-section. Sometimes, unfortunately, it's inevitable because inevitable you have to remove it to get the baby out. But otherwise, you woke up with your fibroids still there, didn't you? <laughs> with your twins delivery. <laughs> Yeah, I'm about to, how, what happened with yours? How did you get the fibroids out? Was it with the twins? No, I had a robotic myomectomy um, this year. I, I, I tried, you know, when I had the twins and they literally were playing with them, I was coming out of the anesthesia. I don't know. I was coming out of <laughs> You had the babies in because, you, know, you know, bless your soul. But I was waking up and they were like, you see this? These are your fibroids. You need to do something about it. And that's how they wow. told me. I tried to treat them on my own, but I I just eventually was like, you know, get them out. That's, I think that's what I said to my doctor. I said to take them out, get them out. You know, so mm -hmm. I didn't get them removed with my twins because, of course, they expressed how dangerous it was. And the fact that I was having twins, they were like, no. It was just like, yeah. no. It's become a life or death situation. I believe the doctor said um, because of the total blood loss that can happen during this infection. Latoya, how often are you having regular checks? How often are you checking yourself? Um, to be fair, they you always have, you know with GP. Sometimes you have to ask the GP to do an, another referral because they discharge you after your check up after your operation here. So you can request, but they always just say, ask you, how are you feeling? How are your periods now? Because again, my periods before used to be like 10 days to two weeks. Now that I've removed them back in November, okay. now three to four days, there's slight pain, but not pelvic pain like I used to have. And I'm not vomiting anymore. Everything is back to normal. So I'm having three to four day periods. But when you do ask the GP, they won't refer you until you say, oh, there's something wrong again. So I've been saving money so I can do private appointments just in, for my just for my safety and just for my, just to reassure myself that they're either gone or they've gone in, or there's any new ones haven't developed because they do say after the operation, small ones can develop. So, I guess my operation was in November and my last checkup was February before the COVID happened. So I guess we're in July now. So I'll, once we, I guess the GP starts seeing people again, I'll request for another checkup to see if there, there's none grown back, yeah. Okay, I'll take on a while then I'll go to Dr. Danso. Yeah, I wanted to mention something very important. I had um, a robotic myomectomy um, in February 25th of this year my periods still have not completely normalized because the, the size of my fibroids, the amount that I had. So they told me that it'll take, because that also is dependent. I also want to let women know who are watching, who have had the surgery and are like, I thought I was supposed to get back to normal. What's going on? Why is it taking so long for my body to adjust? It, they did say it does depend on the size of the fibroids and the amount of fibroids that you have that can take almost up to six months to a year for your body to get back to normal. So I'm still waiting for that period because I do have, I, I, I you know, the first two days are still a little bit of crazy, but it's going to take time, they said, for my body to adjust. So I just wanted to put that out there for anybody who's a little bit scared after the procedure and they see that they're still like having sort of crazy periods that it does take your body time to adjust. I mean, I'm not sure if the doctors want to piggyback on that, but it takes time for your body to adjust after um, the procedure, depending on how many fibroids you have and the size of them. Thank you. 
Dr. Danso, you wanted to add something. I just wanted to speak to Toya really. I mean, it really saddens me that, you know, unfortunately you, you, you know, you feel that you have to go privately. And it's, it's, it's a shame because it's, it's not the first time that I've heard people have had really negative experiences with the NHS. I am a GP, I work within the NHS. And as a, as a NHS GP, um, you or I am my patient's advocate. I am the person that I always say I fight for all my patients. You know, I and, and, and I will ensure that they they get the treatment that that they deserve. So, it what I will say is firstly that GPs are definitely open, We're definitely at work every day. Um, and if you do need to see um, a specialist, the, the GP can process that referral. Yes, it is definitely taking a really long time at the moment because of the situation, but we are still working and people that need to be seen will be seen. So um, definitely try and see your GP with regards to that. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is with regards to private healthcare and NHS healthcare, um, I think sometimes there's a perception that, that private care is, is, is better than NHS care. In, in some respects, people may argue that it is, but most most surgeons and most specialists work in both sectors um, as well. So I, I think, you know, it is a personal decision, but I think the NHS um, is also there to serve people. So it might be worth trying to obtain a second opinion within the NHS. Many people don't know that they can get a second opinion within the NHS, but you can. So if my patient came to me and said, I want to see a different gynecologist, I can encourage them to do that and I can make sure that their referral goes to the right person. So it's just a little bit more information for people that, that maybe did not know that. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Danso. Dr. Hawkins, can you take this one? I wish I could, but I honestly don't know what that is. I'm assuming that's some type of herbal supplement, um, but I'm not sure. And I have no idea what association there is between milk and heavy bleeding. <laughs> I think I, I've never heard of Caprilon either. Have you I heard think, this supplement? No, I've never heard of Caprilon before. I think that's a brand name for something. I'm guessing maybe it's something like, well, actually, I'm not going to guess. It's definitely not something I've heard of, but... Um, perhaps if that person can, if it's a, is it a drug, um, give us some more information, we might be able to help. And I've certainly not he heard anything with regards to drinking milk and stopping heavy periods um, at all. Is there a lot of myths? What are some of the myths or some of the things that you hear um, when it comes to um, fibroids? Can anybody share any of these things? I mean, I mean I've seen people being prayed over at church and, and it's you know the demon inside you that needs to be cast out I've certainly seen that many a time um you know there is definitely a role for religion in terms of like support and um relieving some anxiety but but realistically that's not going to get rid of your fibroid or your heavy heavy bleeding so there are so many myths associated with with fibroids um we talked about infertility as, as one of those things um i'm not sure if dr hawkins has heard any others or if any of the other um panelists have but but there, there are so there are numbers I, I i keep hearing new ones all the time as well okay all right guys we've got 10 more minutes to go we're going to run through the questions that are on the screen and then we will wrap up um but i can't thank my guests so far it's been an amazing conversation um obviously there's a lot of questions so i'm going to run through them as quick as possible um how long does it take uh fibroids to develop because my wife has just developed three which were not visible last year size 15, I think she's got times one, 15 centimeters and four, 15. So fibroids can grow anywhere from a centimeter to a uh, half a centimeter to a centimeter a year, typically. Um, fibroids, when they're usually discovered, maybe on examination, maybe even before symptoms present, are usually sizable because the doctor has to be able to feel it and palpate it on that what we call bimanual exam. Sometimes depending on how the fibroids grow, if they're growing more posterior towards the back, sometimes they're not felt very easily on exams and that's how they can be bigger um, when they're first diagnosed and it seems as if, okay, it's been missed all of this time because clearly it didn't grow to be 14 centimeters in a year's time. 
a normal size uterus is eight by five centimeters or give or take eight by five centimeters. So that definitely is an enlarged uterus, but it has been growing for some time. It didn't happen within the last year. It's just that it wasn't necessarily probably felt on examination, but it would have, it should have shown up on an ultrasound way before now. Okay. Doc, so the mercy has come back. So do you know what the drug is? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it was a name brand. It was, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, transamic acid is something that we use quite commonly. Um, it's non-hormonal. It works to reduce um, the amount of flow, so how much you bleed. It's quite effective, actually. Um, and it's also a good option for people who don't want to rely on something indefinitely. You can, you can sometimes use it as and when, um, and it's hormonal. So uh, it, it's, it's a preference for many people, too. Okay, fantastic. Um, Chrissy, any other questions that we have? Do you agree with this, Adama? Praying about that. It may not be for a run, but... Um, well, yes. I think, as we've kind of mentioned before, depending on what you want, which direction you want to go in, um, if you pray and you hear that the natural path is the best way to go, I think I support that. Uh, everybody's decision on this is going to be different, just depending on what you want. And I think that was said earlier. Um, like I said, I, I definitely prayed about it as well. And I wanted to not do the surgery, but eventually I had to. So, but I definitely say prayer is, prayer will guide you to what you need to do. So definitely, I agree. Okay. And um, um, Doc, um, Dr. Hawkins, can you, I know you've done many surgeries. Can you talk to us briefly about what, how long a surgery is um, roughly? And, you know, what is the procedure of a surgery? How do you come out with a big scar? Like how, how was the surgery done? Sure. So it depends. The, um, the, the very clear cut answer is it depends. Um, as Dr. Gerson said, we always treat each patient as an individual. That means that their surgery is going to be tailored to them as well. What their actual options are depends primarily on what their goals are. As Tanika said, you always want to express to your doctor what is the outcome that you're looking for because the type of procedure or intervention or medication or watch and wait, whatever it may be that we might recommend is going to be based on your end goal. The surgeries, I'm a minimally invasive surgeon, meaning that I did a fellowship training on robotic and laparoscopic surgeries. So I always think first to my patients, how can we do this a minimally invasive way that has to be safe and the safety depends on the location and the size of your fibroids. And then will it give you the outcomes that you're looking for? Are you looking for a flat belly or do you just want um, a uterus that is free of fibroids for the fact that you want to be able to get pregnant and one was close to or inside of your cavity. So what is the end goal? The surgery timing and time depends on the um, procedure. Is it going to be done laparoscopically or is it going to be an open procedure? An open procedure obviously is one that has a larger incision, maybe a C-section type of incision. Um, but typically I try to offer my patients laparoscopic options, robotic options, and those incisions are usually a centimeter or less. And we have um, the newest technology called Assessa or radio frequency ablation of fibroids that's done laparoscopically with two one centimeter incisions to shrink the fibroids. So it depends. There's a whole array of options. Uterine artery embolization has no incisions, maybe a small band-aid. Assessa has two one centimeter incisions. A myomectomy can be done hysteroscopically through the cervix with no incisions, or it can be done laparoscopically with small one centimeter or less incisions, or it can be done through a C-section like incision. And then of course, there's also a hysterectomy, which can be done laparoscopically, vaginally, or through a large incision as well. It depends on the fibroid and the outcome the patient is looking for. Okay. Um, so Tamiko, you had 27 removed. How long did that take in surgery with Dr. Hawkins? Well, no, actually Dr. Yeah. Hawkins, yeah, <laughs> Dr. Hawkins didn't do my uh, 27 fibroids. She did. Okay. 
my second surgery laparoscopically where she went in through my belly button, which I'm always oh, like, wow. yeah, I'm always so amazed that she did that um, or that, that that can be done. Um, but my first surgery was um, what they call the bikini cut, which is the C-section cut. So I was, I have a scar going across my lower abdomen and that was extremely painful. The recovery was extremely long and um, I definitely recommend if you can get a minimally invasive gynecologist who is trained to do minimally invasive surgeries, then absolutely go that route because um, my recovery was just like night and day um, in terms of having the bikini cut and going versus going through my belly button. Um, so obviously the doctors can speak to what the technique is that lessens the pain, or maybe Dr. Hawkins is just bomb like that, but <laughs> she was able to, <laughs> which that's what I'm going to go with, that she's just bomb like that. Um, and not that, the, not that the other doctor wasn't, but it was just much more invasive. Mm. Yeah, so, so 27 versus, how many did we check out last time, Dr. Hawkins? Five, I believe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. How many hours? Five hours. Yeah, it depends on the size and the locations of the fibroid, which you're actually a good candidate for. So some patients like mine, I had a lapar I mean, I had a open um, abdominal procedure like Tanika. So I have an incision from hip to hip, but it was because my fibroids were too large for a laparoscopic option. So the second time Tanika presented, her uterus and her fibroids were smaller than I'm sure they were the first time with her right. first position that had to offer her a more invasive procedure. And even in that, educate yourself, ladies. Like know that even if you have an open abdominal procedure, ask for an uncue pump, ask for a silver lawn dress, and ask for the things that will make it less invasive. My patients, even after an open abdominal procedure, still go home the very next day. And they go home in very minimal pain. And many of them use maybe a handful of narcotics, if any at all, from an open abdominal procedure. When me and Tanika had our surgery, I thought I was down and out for two for two weeks. I thought I wasn't going to stand up straight. <laughs> the techniques yeah. have changed and we've advanced. The technology has advanced. So you should be able to find doctors that are going to offer you the very best. But Dr. Hawkins, I will say that I think that patients need to know the things to ask for. Like yeah. those things you just rattled off, like I think those are important because if a doctor presents to you that, hey, you do need an open myomectomy, you know, it's not, we can't just throw our hands up and say, well, that's what they said. So I think as patients, educating ourselves on what are some of those things that can make it less invasive, and those are the things we should be advocating for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's a he is an incredible surgeon. <laughs> I love so, what so I do. Do you do private? I mean, can people contact you if they're, you know, if they've got issues? Are you able to do the surgeries? How do they book, you know, um, consult, consult, consultation time with you? Sure. So I, I, um, I do virtual visits. I did virtual visits even before COVID, but certainly now um, in this um, environment that we're in. So Yini Hawkins, MD, is my social media handle. And my practice is five can everybody type in their social media in the private chat so I can quickly pull it on the screen? Because sure. um, I and should then, have done that at the beginning. Mm -hmm. and, then, and your email is my talk. My, the simplest way and the easiest way for people to probably remember to get to me is um, on the internet is getfibroidhelp.com. So if you type in www.getfibroidhelp.com, you'll get to my personal website. And um, there's, you know, you can send me a, a message from there. Okay, so right. Okay, so I'm just going to get everybody to do their closing remarks. Um, I'm going to start with Latoya because I started with you. Latoya, this is Latoya's um, social media handle. This is her on Instagram. Um, Latoya, you know, your last few words for people, um, young women that have been in your position or in your position right now that are really scared um, about fibroids, what would your advice be to somebody that's, you know, of your age and is really, really worried that they're not gonna be have, able to have children, they're scared about the surgery, what would be your advice? I'd say whatever symptoms you're having, listen to your body, 
um, don't be afraid and don't pull it to the side. Act on it because that's something I did in the beginning. So, and also share if there's someone that you're close to, a friend, um, family members, just talk to them about it and then you can have that support. Um, I feel that support helps me a lot. So I do urge the young women my age, any, any, any lady to always just seek for support and don't feel ashamed and you're not alone because there's a lot of people dealing with this. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And that is um, Latoya's um, social media handle. You can contact her. I'm sure she'll be happy to assist in any way that she can with more advice and, you know, anything that she's also been through, she'll be able to, um, you know, explain what she went through to help you in your situation. Latoya, thank you so much for joining me on the show. Thank you. Thanks. And I'm going to connect all of you up because I know some of you don't know each other, so I'm going to do an email and connect everybody up as well so you can all get to know each other as well. Thank you. Okay, next I'm going to go to my sister, Tamika. Yes, my new sister, yes. I love it. Thank yes. you so much for the opportunity, Denta, to share. Um, this was incredible sharing with other women, and it just... Um, warms my heart when I hear people talking about issues that we've been told that you know we shouldn't talk about and it's not ladylike and it's not classy. Um, but for every woman out there that listened to us today, thank you for sharing your time with us. I just want to say to women that it is so important to share your story to make sure that we are allowing people to know what these symptoms are like, what we're going through, and it really helps us heal and it helps other women understand that they are not alone. The other thing I would say is to be your own best health advocate. We can have great doctors like Dr. Denso and Dr. Hawkins, um, but the truth of the matter is that not every doctor is like them. Um, so we have to be our own best health advocate. You have to make sure that you are journaling about your symptoms so that when you go to the doctor, you can have um, information to share with them so that they won't um, dismiss your symptoms. And also so that you can make um, the, the best choices for yourself. And like I said earlier, make sure that you find your tribe, make sure that you find the group of individuals who will support you along your journey. And also, I, didn't, I don't think about this earlier, we did talk about the mental health component, but also I found that therapy and finding a mental health professional to help me through this was, was important. I think it was uh, Latoya who talked about um, not even recognizing that she was going through some form of depression. And the same thing happened to me, that you don't even recognize how daunting and how burdensome um, fibroids can be on your mental health. So finding a mental health professional was uh, life-changing for me. And the last thing I'll say is you have to be the CEO of your body. You have to recognize what's going on in your body and make changes, document those changes, so that, as I said earlier, that you can go to your doctor armed with information to make the best decisions for your body. Thank you so much, Tamika. I really appreciate your time today. And thank you so much for the beautiful advice. We really appreciate it. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, and I'm going to bring my sister, Duma, on. Sis, your last few words for people that are watching you today. Um, you've been very encouraging. Um, what was your last words to say to people that are um, also in your position and don't know what to do? Well, I'll start off with saying this. I won't say too much because I'll end up crying. This was phenomenal. But um, to everyone watching, I will definitely say be fearless. Um, as soon as we hear bad news, we let fear take over. But be fearless and just have faith in whatever's going to happen next. So be fearless. Don't be afraid. Um, important for us to let our emotions run wild because a lot of times, Women like to keep things in. We like to be strong. We like to be brave, but it's okay to just let your emotions be free. And most importantly, talk about it. 
you know, I was in a place of shame at one point, but it's okay to talk about it. Don't worry about what people think or what they will say, because the ones that really care about you and love you will help you get help. Because sometimes we don't know how to get help for ourselves. They will help you get help. So just be fearless, be brave, important, talk about it and get the help that you need. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aduma. I really appreciate you. Thank you, sis. Yeah. Okay, I'll go over to my sister, Akia. Oh, hold on. There she is. Akia, so, yeah. as you know, young people of your age, 23, married, um, you know, there could be a young person that's also married, very scared to even talk to her partner about it. What would be your advice to them? Um, I would definitely say don't be scared to talk to your partner at this point. If you're married, be open with your husband. You guys want to go through it together. Because um, even if you don't tell them, they can see the thing they're going through, and it's better to go through it with somebody after a long time. Um, being mm -hmm. as I am, it can be scary, but you know, if I've gone through it, you can go through it too. Um, like they said, do the research, see what options you have. Um, my doctor told me to do the surgery, and I just went straight with it. Um, but if there were other options, I didn't know you could do it after properly. I would have done that. Um, so definitely do your research. And like Tanika said, know your body, listen to your body, and do not ignore the symptoms. Can't hear you. Oh, oops. I said thank you so much for joining me on the show, Akria. I was on mute. <laughs> <laughs> Take care. Okay, now I'm going to have my doc. Um, Dr. Hawkins, do you think that we are, as black African women, as, you know, black people, we are scared to even go to our GPs to, to, to get, you know, examined? Um, and what is, you know, your advice to women out there that, probably are living with it, but because they don't want to go to the GP, um, we'll never know and we'll never be able to stop the pain that they are going through. Mm -hmm. um, give us another chance. That's what I would say. I would say that a lot of that is rooted in um, experiences and trauma that um, individuals may have been felt. Give give us as a physician community another chance because we, we will hone the responsibility that we have to do better and care better for our women, especially for our African-American women and our African women and Black women and um, women of color in general. Um, we're, like you said earlier, we're uncovering so much about our culture and our um, economics and social disparities even. And, and a lot of that is in our medical um, field and arena as well. So we will take our positions in the blame that we have caused as your providers and we will take better responsibility for your care. I am crying out for women to just not live in suffering. I wholeheartedly do not believe that God um, created us to suffer. I believe that he gave us options. He gave us physicians. He gave us medicine. He gave us surgery. He gave us technology to be able to address these things. So don't sit at home in silence. Now that you are listening to this um, wonderful platform and you've heard the stories and you realize that you are not alone, um, and you realize that there are physicians and providers out there who care, um, find your local doctor who cares. They're, they're there. We are here. Um, and we don't want you to live in silence, nor do we want you to suffer um, alone. We have options for you. Thank you so, so much for your words of advice. We really appreciate you, Doc. Um, have a safe journey back home. Um, and definitely, I'm going to keep in touch with you. There's a lot of people that are private messaging me as well. And actually, one last question is that somebody messaged and said a private one on my phone and said that there is um, apparently there's a notion that fibroids affect fertility when you're in your 40s. Is that true? So fibroids have the potential to affect fertility at any age, depending on where they're located, but they don't always do so. The percentage of times that fibroids actually cause infertility is very small. It's less than 20%. People don't realize that 
And that's the first fear that comes to many women's mind when they're diagnosed. It was my first fear. And I've had two children since my fibroid surgery and my fibroids have not regrown. And it's been 10 years. I like to give that testimony because I want individuals to not feel defeated before they've even given um, a treatment or, um, you know, a option, a chance. So it's not that fertility is impossible at 40 with fibroids. There are many, many, many women that get pregnant with fibroids and have very successful, very healthy pregnancies and do very well. We unfortunately can't predict how fibroids will behave in pregnancy. Will they grow? Will they affect the baby and the size of the baby? Will they cause problems? And for you not to be able to have a natural vaginal delivery, you know, all of those questions are unknown, but none of it is impossible. None of it is impossible with fibroids. None of it is impossible. Thank you so much. I think that's what we're going to all take away with us um, today. Thank you so much, Doc, Thank and have a safe journey back home. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye. Bye. Okay. Anoa, sis, Hi. from somebody who was a fitness person, you know, eating healthy, you know, shows that, you know, it doesn't matter what you do, you can still somehow get it, but you can change your lifestyle to adapt to what you're going through. And, I, and I've heard from you know the conversations with the women on the platform that everybody's situation is slightly different. Um, and so what would you say to a young person that's also like really, really fit and you know they've been diagnosed with fibroid and they're you know, at their wits end, what would your advice be to them? Well, my, one of my biggest, um, I guess my, my a really important key, key point that I wanna make is that you got to do what works for you. Um, I think that a lot of times, some of our fellow, you know, women, we can we can shame. You know, it's like people are there are people who are very against surgery, and they want to really, um, you know, prohibit other people. Of course, I always believe that that should be your last resort. But you only know what you've been going through, and so you have to find out what works for you. I went the natural route. I tried my best to try to. Um, combated on my own. I improved it for a little bit, but then they it got worse, and I had to figure out a way of what what figure out what would work best for me. And I just decided to do surgery because my quality of living was very poor, and I wanted to have some type of normalcy to my life. Um, so, being a fitness professional, I came out also to let people know that you know everybody, a lot of people get it. It's not just terms of people who have a poor diet or um, genetics or whatever the case may be, anyone can have it, you know? Um, so don't feel, in, don't feel ashamed by it and try to find a procedure that works best for you. I thought it works best for me and I'm very happy with my decision. So um, I also want them to feel comfort in the fact that, you know, me coming out saying that I had twins is also that light at the end of the tunnel uh, for women who are trying to conceive that you can have children. I'm a testimony to that. Um, I, the fibroids were there while I was pregnant. Um, so anything is possible, find what works for you. And also don't give up hope, you know, don't give up hope. I don't give up hope. And I think that's really, really important as well, that we shouldn't give up on ourselves and the situation, but actually, you know, there are options. And um, so what are you doing currently through your journey? Are you are you hoping to have more children? What are, What are your plans? Well, let's just say, I mean, having twins uh, is boot camp. Um, <laughs> but I, I mean, I do look towards, I mean, I am open to having more children in the future. Um, so I, like I said, I adopted a pescatarian lifestyle, um, you know, primarily because like I said, a lot of research that I have done has linked a lot of the hormones to meats and stuff like that. So I just wanted to have a clean slate and it just made it, you know, easier for me to do that. So I would like to probably have more children in the future. So I'm trying to give myself the best chance, just, you know, continuing to live a healthy lifestyle, but just embarking on a, a, a you know, a slightly different path that I believe is going to make a difference overall. Sis, thank you so much for joining me on the show. 
Yes, I'm definitely going to be connecting with you after this. <laughs> thank because you. that body that you have, that fitness, that, all of that, I need to get some of that. So I'm <laughs> going to be messaging you after this show. <laughs> all right, no problem. <laughs> thank you for having me. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, sis. Doc, Dr. Dan, so thank wow. you so much, Doc. I mean, we've been a lot today. It's been impactful, insightful, um, emotional, inspirational. Um, and I hope that the audience that have watched today have been very much impacted um, by today's show. Um, what would be your words in terms of, you know, somebody, oh, let me put your social media handle up one second. Um, okay, this is Dr. Danso's um, Instagram handle, um, where you can contact her for more information and more advice. Doc, for women that are scared to come to the GP and, you know, a lot of women are saying they're going private, how does that make you feel as somebody that works for the it's NHS? It's so heartbreaking, but unfortunately it's something that I've heard before. What I would say is that, you know, unfortunately it's, 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 it's us, like, like Dr. Hawkins said, we have created this. And I, you know, there are times when I see women that have been you know, I don't want to say it, but they have been fobbed off for several years and they almost feel so relieved that firstly, A, that I'm black and I'm a woman. They feel that they can talk to me and they feel that something can be done. So all I would say, particularly to any healthcare professionals that are that are watching is just, just be a little bit more empathetic. Just realise that people have people, it takes so much courage to to firstly book the appointment and then turn up to the appointment. People offer it for months, years. So, so to dismiss somebody in 10 minutes just is just not fair. So what I would say is to healthcare professionals, just listen, listen to what someone has to say. Um, and for, for anyone who is trying to seek help, just have an idea of what you would what you want. Have an idea. I always ask patients, what would you like out of this consultation? What 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 had you hoped for before you came here? Because that will make sure that we're both singing from the same hymn sheet. So that would be my advice. Okay. And what about, you know, those those partners? How are you encouraging the, um, you know, the male partners to really support the females? Yeah, I mean, all these, I think men have to really be more involved and, um, and be more understanding as well. Often when we talk about period problems and, and problems related to fertility, it's often the woman that comes alone. Um, but with, with these problems, it's, it's a joint effort, you know, it doesn't take one person to make a baby. So even when you are referred to see a fertility specialist, you need to go together because often it's actually not, not the woman. Sometimes it's a male factor. So I think um, men definitely need to at least try and be understanding, try and also get information as well um, to try and help their partners, their sisters, their mothers, because no one wants to see their loved ones suffering and no one should be suffering. So um, I encourage everybody that's watching this to, to share it with not just um, female viewers, but to male viewers too, because somebody may see something that a relative is is suffering with and, and that suffering can end. Fantastic. Thank you so, so much for joining me on the show, Doc. Um, I'm sure that there's going to be uh, many other shows that I'm going to get you and Dr. Hawkins back on the show. But thank you so much for your time this evening. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Okay. Um, to everybody watching, I hope that you've enjoyed the show. Please actually use um, this email address for Dr. Hawkins. Um, um, it's drhawkins at fpwcg.com um, for more information on how she can help you if you want to book surgery with her. Um, she can do virtual consultations as well. Um, so please do get in touch with her. I hope that you've enjoyed the show. Please let me know that you've enjoyed the show, um, that you've gotten, you know, great insight to what fibroids is and how you can, you know, go about having treatment. Um, you know, it depends on everybody is different. Our bodies are totally different. Um, and so I think that, you know, you need that doctor to be able to tell you which route that you need to go. You need to listen to your body. Um, you need to see that, you know, if I'm getting cramps, if I'm getting lower back pains, something is absolutely wrong. And so it's important for us black people to make sure that we're going for checkups. I think it's something that, you know, we don't like to do, but it's really, really important that we do go to regular checkups and check up on ourselves, our breasts, everything. So we don't find out things when they are very, very late on when you could have done something about it. 
earlier on. So again, thank you all for watching. Um, again, I want to say a big thank you to um, World Remit for sponsoring the show. Um, I want to say a big thank you to um, Seek. Um, as I said, she has these headphones. Look at these. They are amazing. When you listen to music, you're just, your, ear, your earbuds are just buzzing because it's powerful. You can hear the beat, the bass, everything. Um, go online to www.seekvr.com. Use the promo code Dental VIP, and everybody gets 10% discount off on all Seek products. So make sure that you go online and you purchase one. Um, again, here's the products, how it looks like. Absolutely beautiful, stunning. Um, a big thank you to World Remit, as I said before, for um, supporting our show. Um, and I say a big thank you to Glow Village. Again, um, supporting young people that are doing amazing things. Um, this is her Instagram if you want to purchase some of her products. Um, and I've also got a Regal Touch. I'm just going to put a picture up of, you know, the type of balloons that she's doing for birthdays, christenings. You know, get in touch with her if you are wanting to give a loved one a surprise for their birthdays or christenings or weddings, whatever it is. She also does events as well. So you can contact her for your needs. Um, again, I say thank you to my team uh, for making today possible. Without you, the show would not be possible. So thank you so much um, to all my team. Uh, I'm so glad people are enjoying the show. Thank you for the great conversation. Um, and again, my, my speakers, um, I must say, you know, I messaged everybody literally on Instagram and they all were just up for it and have been able to come on here and share their experiences. I can't thank them enough. Um, thank you, Chrissy. Thank you, Naomi, Pearl, and Cassandra for putting on the show and contacting everybody and emailing everybody. Um, I hope that you've been inspired. I hope that you've been educated. And I hope that a lot more of you, um, when you see somebody with a big belly, not to say you look pregnant or whatever, we don't know what people are going through. We don't know what people are having and what issues they're going through. And so it's really, really important that we are sensitive to everybody. Thank you so, so much for watching tonight's show. I will see you next week, Thursday, where we'll bring you another topic. Um, if there's any other topics that you also want to see, any other um, social Sundays are social Sundays. And so let me know if there's, I know somebody emailed me about, we should talk about sickle cell. Um, somebody emailed me that we should talk more about breast cancer on Sundays. Please let me know what topic that you think um, is in our community that would impact on people that we can, you know, discuss and talk about. Um, thank you so, so much, everybody. Have a wonderful evening and I'll see you next week. God bless you. Bye-bye.